is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, you're all very welcome to the meeting this morning. In the room with me at the moment, I have Alex Aston and Andy Allen. On Starleaf, we have Sinead Ennis, Karen Mullen, Mark Durkin, and the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong. Um, so, agenda item one then is apologies. Any apologies any member wants to bring today? No? Nope. Okay. Go ahead. Unfortunately, we'll need to leave um, just before 12 because I have to go to the recall. Thank you, Kelly. And I know Alex has said that he might have to go out for a time as well. Look, we'll play it by ear when we get to there. I would hope that we can still continue. We will be taking a lunch break at some stage, so we will, but we'll see how we get on. All right? And we'll just play that by ear. And of course, um, should our meeting continue on um, further into the afternoon, which I imagine it will do, um, if there's a vote or anything, we will uh, just suspend the meeting at that stage. Uh, and then resume back again. So we'll just, as I say, we'll play it by ear as we go along and see how we get on. We need five members um, here for a, a, a quorum uh, to make decisions, but we need four members here for a quorum to hear from witnesses um, and to, to have you know those conversations. So we'll just keep that in mind, everybody. Okay, then I'm going to move on to agenda item two, which is the draft minutes. Members, you'll find the draft minutes at page... Uh, six of your meeting pack. So can I ask members, are they content to agree the minutes of the 25th of March 2021 as drafted? Great. Great. Good stuff. Okay, members, then we'll move on to item number three, which is chairperson's business. Members, just to remind you that today's meeting was set up in recess to ensure we had enough time for the licensing bill uh, deliberations. Now, in addition, we also have the evidence sessions on the Sports Sustainability Fund, so um, the meeting will likely run it well into the afternoon. Um, we can only do this because we are in recess and no other committee is coming in after us today, so we're, we're not going to be kicked out of the door at 20 past one. Um, member, at last week's meeting, uh, you'll remember that uh, last Wednesday I um, asked the clerk to put the department, the minister and Sport NI under notice. Um, uh, of course, that was dependent on the committee last week. Um, so at committee last week, we then um, decided as a committee that we were going to have this briefing today. Um, so last Thursday, a call was put out to the minister, to the department and to Sport NI um, to ask for availability for, uh, it was for the Wednesday and Thursday of this week. Um, so it became apparent then on Friday evening um, that the minister was going to have difficulty coming in to brief us. So we then put a call out for any day this week. We would have been, uh, because members had said they would come in at any stage, they didn't mind what day it was. Um, so uh, the minister phoned me on Monday evening and spoke to me and explained to me that she had no availability at all this week to come in and brief the committee. Um, so we will not have her here. Um, so we will only have departmental officials and Sport NI. Um, so uh, members, any comments on that? No? Oh. Well, sorry, go ahead, Alex. Um, just to express my disappointment, the Minister isn't here. Um, this is a really important issue. It's caused an awful lot of controversy. And we've all made the time to come to this committee today, an extra committee during the Easter recess, to discuss this vital issue. And I just think it's shameful that the Minister couldn't find the time to come to this committee and answer the very important questions that the public need to know about what's been going on with this, <coughs> this money. And um, it's just an absolute disgrace. We can make the time, all of us, but the Minister can't. Okay. Thank you. All right, Alex, thank you for that. Um, okay, members, any other comments? Are we happy to move on? Yeah, Andy, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Chair, I would echo uh, Alex's comments. Um, I would like to have seen the Minister here uh, on this important issue. Um, but one thing I, I would highlight from my perspective is I've been concerned at the limited uh, availability of the Minister in the past as well. I know we've previously discussed that, and um, I don't for one moment doubt that the Minister has uh, many competing, uh, competing priorities. But you know it's important that she's available to come and engage with this committee um, from the scrutiny aspect and also from the aspect um, of us assisting the minister in, in her role and ensuring that we can put forward a strong and robust argument to the, the areas of the minister's department that we need to see moving forward. Um, there's a lot of legislation, etc., um, how to executive reform, so forth, so on. And I'd like to see the minister come before the committee uh, a bit more often. 
Okay, no, thank you for that, Andy. And, and you, you'll know that we did have that, that discussion some weeks ago about having a, a, an extra day. <coughs> And even if it wasn't um, a start where it was, uh, where we, it would be re on on the record, we still needed to have those conversations with the minister. Um, I, uh, we didn't get too far with that either, um, but I certainly understand your concerns, and I understand also the issue around the executive meeting on a Thursday causes this committee a great problem when it comes to um, the minister's availability. Um, but uh, as I say, we, we will be putting in those calls again. And absolutely, from I mean, we've got to hear an evidence session here um, from the Department on Sport NI. We will be making decisions at the end of that evidence session. And if that is that the committee want to go forward and do a, an actual inquiry into this, then the minister will have to attend. I mean, there will be no excuses around that. I mean, we can compel the minister to attend committee. It, do, it doesn't happen very often, and committees do not like to do it. And it, it, it's a long, drawn-out process of actually putting a motion forward to the House. We don't want to do that. It's not the done thing generally in committees. Um, but um, I, I agree that we do. We, we, it would be good for the minister to come in and talk on various issues, um, not just this issue. Okay, members. Anything else, Robin? Uh, Chair, I do. Previous two speakers agree. Uh, I think it might be appropriate, Chair, if the committee would agree that uh, via yourself as the Chair, that a, uh, a short press statement go out indicating the disappointment of, of the Minister in, in not attending, when, particularly when it is, as others have said, this matter in particular, but indeed in the wider context. Um, <laughs> It, 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 just in terms of the whole performance of the department, and the, uh, and as Andy has said, not only for us to scrutinise what the minister is doing, but indeed to insist, uh, assist with the, uh, uh, the the department's functions as a whole. Um, the minister's non-attendance stands in stark contrast to other ministers who are nearly on either a, a, at least a monthly basis attending committees and indeed attending a, a committee to, for committee motions within the chamber. So I, I think, Chair, it, it would be, if the committee would agree that a, a letter expressing our disappointment uh, is issued uh, as a press statement by yourself, Chair. Okay, look, I'm happy enough to put that to the meeting. Um, we can do that at the end of our briefing, whenever we're deciding what way we want to go forward, um, because we need to listen to the briefing first as well, because um, there might be other recommendations. So I'm happy, if members are happy, to leave, to park that until the end of the meeting, and then we'll decide on a, a, a way forward from that. Any other member want to make any comment at this stage? Are we happy that we move on now? Chair, can I just go yes. there? I'm not going to come out and make excuses, and I do understand the frustration. I just heard there in the commentary, you know, that the minister made excuses. I, I believe she would have genuine reasons um, for not attending. Um, I understand the frustration maybe from some of the meetings in the past, but I know myself this is recess week, and I had to cancel all of my diary appointments for today or rearrange them because we're here. So. Uh, I'm in no way defending, but uh, you know, I think it's it's not excuses. Um, I think she has she. I, I would you know definitely put forward she has genuine uh, diary commitments. Okay, no, thank you for that, Karen, as well. Um, any other member? Anything they want to say at this stage, or can we move on? Yes, we move on. Okay. All right, then we're going to move on then to our agenda item four, which is a departmental and a sport NI briefing on the Sports Sustainability Fund. Members, you'll find the papers for this agenda item starting at page 24 of your meeting pack. Then um, can I then ask broadcasting um, to put the, the members into the audience and then bring into the spotlight um, Catherine Hill, Tony Murphy from the department and Antoinette McKeown and John News from Sport NI. Okay, can we, uh, there we go, bear with me people, there we are, everybody's in. Okay, can I then, just before we start, um, ask who will be leading on this session before I start it? Uh, Chair, um, Antoinette and I were going to jointly lead it if you were happy with that. Um, if you were content, I would set out some opening remarks and then Antoinette would follow. 
That's okay. That's fine then. We can go with that. Then that's Catherine and then Antoinette. Um, if you could keep your opening remarks to a maximum of maybe 10 minutes, and then that will allow time for uh, the committee to come in and ask various questions. So go ahead. No problem. Thank you very much. So I'm going to briefly set out the need for expenditure and the fund objectives, and Antoinette's going to cover fund design and delivery. So reflecting back in the past 12 months, no one could have foreseen the impact that the coronavirus would have had not only in sport, but in all aspects of life here. So in those first few months of the pandemic, the sports governing bodies, clubs, participants and volunteers all stepped up and played a key role in supporting the most vulnerable in society. They delivered food, prescriptions and gave much needed contact and support. So sport is a huge part of our society here. It also makes a significant contribution to the economy, both as an employer and through attracting thousands of visitors and generating millions of pounds. The 2018 DCMS report indicated that sport in Northern Ireland has a gross value added of 298 million pounds, has 1,100 businesses and employs 11,000 people. 2019 saw over 123,000 golf visitors to Northern Ireland, with golf tourism making a 52 million contribution to the economy. It's estimated that a golf visitor spends one pound in green fees, they'll spend four pounds elsewhere in the economy. The sports sector provides an outlet for young people, adults, older people, making a significant contribution to the health and well-being of society in terms of both physical and mental health. In recognition of the value of sport, a number of funding programmes have been put in place to provide various levels of support to help the sector, which has been severely impacted by the restrictions. The schemes developed aim to meet the diverse needs of the sector. So from small clubs who hire facilities, clubs who own and maintain their own facilities, large professional clubs with social and hospitality services, and a range of governing bodies. In terms of other support provided to the sector so far, the Sports Hardship Fund has provided 911 grassroots clubs with grants of two or three thousand pounds, linked 2.2 million. This fund has helped small clubs cover essential costs such as insurance and maintenance and sustain them so that they're ready to recommence activities when it's safe to do so. For example, the grassroots sports clubs that have benefited from the Sports Hardship Fund have included 270 football clubs, 183 GAA clubs, 72 boxing clubs and 32 hockey clubs. Sport NI is also administering a COVID safe PPE pack programme which is distributing £800,000 worth of essential protective equipment to over 1,000 clubs. So throughout the last year, the department, together with Sport NI, has engaged extensively with all parts of the sector to understand the challenges faced on the ground. This included a co-design process with the sector to shape the Sports Sustainability Fund. The committee will be aware of these challenges from your engagement with the sector. For example, the submissions from NIFL and IFA presented to the committee in October, highlighting the precarious financial position of the clubs. These challenges were reflected across the sector, with games played behind closed doors and a massive hit to income. From the Belfast Giants to Ulster Rugby, the IFA, Ulster GAA, all were clear that they faced an uncertain future if financial support was not put in place, with estimated losses in the region of £25 million. This evidence from the sector was reflected in the development of the business case for the Sustainability Fund. As with all the emergency funds, it was developed at pace given the urgency of the situation and the immediate financial need. It was undertaken in a highly dynamic and fluid environment, and it was underpinned by challenges around data and resourcing. The business case for the fund was prepared and approved in November 2020 in accordance with managing public money and NICS guidance. Business cases were prepared to support decision making in line with guidance but were proportionate to the circumstances, most particularly the time available to take decisions, which was often days when it would normally be months. This process included the preparation of a Section 75 screening document, as well as a rural proofing document, to test if the funding would disadvantage any groups or sections of society. Those documents included as an objective addressing net losses leading to, leading to cash flow difficulties and ultimately the imminent threat of closure. That reflected one of a number of scenarios that clubs and governing bodies were indicating as a possible outcome if financial support was not provided to the sector. The objectives of the fund were developed in line with this initial policy intent and in response to the need defined in the business case. These objectives were 
to minimize the financial stress on the sports sector due to lost income as a result of COVID-19, so as to sustain the sector, and to enable governing bodies and clubs to plan and prepare to increase opportunities for participation in sport, recreation and community use following the end of the restrictions. The Sports Sustainability Fund aims to sustain and secure the sector. As with all elements of the emergency response, it's inevitable that there will be lessons to be learned and we're already working to consider these. However, at this stage, it's too early to determine what we could have done differently. However, it's also true to say that there's positive learning from the experience and the two teams worked in partnership throughout, strengthening the relationship and understanding between the department and Sport NI. The Permanent Secretary has already been engaging with internal audit on reviewing the performance of the full suite of DSC COVID responses. In light of the recent focus on the Sports Sustainability Fund, she has asked that this review be carried out first and a terms of reference is being developed. We also understand that in the meantime, the CNAG has indicated that the NIAO will carry out a review and the Department will engage on the timing and nature of this. Indeed, the NIAO have already engaged with officials in the Department and the NIAO received the business case for the Sustainability Fund on the 24th of February as part of ongoing work on COVID schemes. So once the business case was approved, the next stage was to develop the operational criteria for the scheme. This was led by Sport NI as the established and exper experienced grant giving body for the sector. And I'm going to hand over to Antoinette to cover the detail on scheme design and delivery. Antoinette. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, committee members, for giving us an opportunity to explain to you this morning our work on the Sports Sustainability Fund. In terms of scheme design and delivery, um, the Sustainability Fund was co-designed with both... Can I just stop you a wee minute? Some members are, are saying that there's a wee bit of trouble with sound. Can I ask our members in Starley, for they hearing that OK? Uh, Kelly and Sinead have come in. Kelly and Sinead, can you hear it OK? Yeah, they're giving the thumbs up. That's grand. That's okay. Um, can, I'll yeah. take, can we take our members back out of the spotlight? Apologies, Antoinette, for this. Just bear with me a minute. It's quite low in the room yeah, here for yeah. us to hear it. Um, so it is. I, I know I'm fine, but I know other members are saying that they're having a bit of difficulty. I'm so, not, Antoinette, I'm can we just ask you just to touch the, the maybe not to shout, but just to speak up just a little bit? That would help us greatly. And apologies for interrupting. Thank you. Not at all, Chair. That's fine. I'll move closer to the mic as well. Is that any better? That's slightly better, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, as I'd um, just said, the in terms of design and delivery, the Sports Sustainability Fund was co-designed with the Department for Communities and the entire sports sector. The programme design reflected the very clear needs being articulated at the time in terms of financial challenges being faced by the sector. The eligibility criteria was established to support due diligence um, in managing public money with a very clear evidence-based approach to determining net losses and an objective, consistent and transparent approach for a broad and very diverse range of clubs and governing bodies of sport across Northern Ireland. The programme was developed during an unprecedented period of uncertainty, constant change, stress and hardship impacting the sports sector as and that was as a result of ongoing lockdowns and restrictions going back into lockdown again um, in early um, well just after Christmas actually and um, there was a need to progress at pace given concerns of risk of closure being raised um, by a whole range of governing bodies and clubs in the sports sector. In summary, an analysis of the market testing and evidence of needs was undertaken. Guiding principles such as accountability, transparency and consistency of approach, equality and inclusion and accessibility and a methodology of co-design were applied and the time constraint to address threat were reasonably considered as part of that programme design. In terms of the process, there was a consensus among sports governing bodies supported by the Department and Sport NI that sports governing bodies should submit the applications to Sport NI with just one overall application for their respective sports as they were best able to recognise their club needs. Governing bodies therefore had a key role in the application process by sense checking and collating the application forms for their affiliated clubs. 
the application process allowed for COVID related net losses to be assessed and losses from issues which you'll be very aware of, um, streams associated with loss of spectators, those paying to take part in competition and, and, and socially just taking part in events and, and classes, membership dues, income from fees, including green fees and sponsorship and other income generating activities. All applications were subject to the same consistent assessment process. And as an additional feature, the department had provided expertise from Ernst Young to assist with the verification of the applications, including the larger claims from governing bodies and clubs. Also, to protect public funding, applicants were required to declare any other COVID related funding that they had received or had applied for. In addition, Applicants could not include capital expenditure, including costs of major refurbishment work. The Sports Sustainability Fund was not simply a straightforward income replacement scheme. That option had been disregarded as inappropriate. The Sports Sustainability Fund has provided funding to 35 governing bodies and 430 sports clubs, as Catherine has just set out. An additional safeguard is provided in the terms and conditions of each letter of offer issued, which clearly states the Sport NI reserves the right to investigate the claim and, where appropriate, seek recovery of all or part of the award. Our focus from the outset was a strong focus on maintaining and sustaining the support sector through unprecedented challenges. Our policy intent remains the same, and we are aware that a need to support the sports sector was very clearly evidenced and in some parts it, um, that financial need continues. Thank you very much. Thank you Antoinette and thank you Catherine as well. Um, I, members just to make you aware I have uh, Kelly, Sinead and Alex have their hands up. Anybody else wants to ask questions can they put their hands up as well. Um, I suppose we know why we're here um, today. Um, the Sports Sustainability Fund, um, absolutely, when the committee first heard about it and right way through, most of it we were absolutely agree in agreement that our sports clubs, who have done an awful lot during COVID and have really have uh, gone over and above in many ways, especially our grassroots sports, um, in helping um, with the, the sort of the relief during COVID. Um, so we very much welcomed that they were going to be helped in some way. Um, I think, though, We've got to the position we're in now because we have seen of some of the amounts that have been handed out. And we've seen some of those amounts that, that appear extremely large in comparison um, to what many other uh, businesses, because quite often some a lot of these sports clubs are also businesses and they're run as businesses, there's businesses within them. So it's just, I want to ask just a few questions um, around that. Um, I know, I want to just first of all ask, um, ask you, Catherine, you had mentioned there about um, the, the, you'd said this, these were one of a number of issues as to why someone could apply. So that was net losses, cash flow, and, clo and threat of closure. Um, what other issues, other than those um, uh, major issues for any sporting club, what other issues would have made them, uh, given them some sort of entitlement um, to apply for this? Because we had originally, I know certainly whenever we had originally um, seen the documents for this, certainly the, the threat of closure was within the original um, reason as to why um, someone could apply for the Sports Sustainability Fund. Um, but just want to know, um, is that was that the case with all of these clubs that received money? Did you see evidence that they were imminently are about to close if they didn't receive a, a cash injection? Or were there other issues? So, Chair, I mean, the primary purpose of the fund was to stabilise and sustain the sports sector. And certainly one of the risks identified very early on was the imminent threat of closure. And actually, it was governing bodies themselves which often cited this real risk and also was around the ability to, to meet their going concern status. So at a sectoral level, we were hearing that if support wasn't put in place, clubs would close, meaning that after the pandemic, we wouldn't have the healthy and balanced sports sector. And um, the screening exercise did include, as an objective, um, addressing uh, net losses leading to cash flow difficulties and ultimately the imminent threat of closure. And this was being cited very clearly by the likes of Ulster Rugby, the Belfast Giants and the Sports Forum. But there were a number of other objectives. So those objectives included, for example, that financial interventions mitigate the negative impacts on the sports sector and ongoing delivery of key sporting provision. And that given the critical nature of financial loss to the sports sector, the need to ensure that support reached bank accounts in a timely manner. 
So there were a number of overarching objectives, and these objectives were set out in the business case. They were culminated to reach the position of minimising financial stress and enabling um, clubs and governing bodies to prepare to increase opportunities for participation. But the principles set out in the business case formed the basis for Sport NI to determine the operational framework. So the fund was designed to remove subjectivity and eligibility was confirmed by evidenced financial losses by clubs affiliated to recognised governing bodies. And this ensured equity of approach across all the clubs. The operational criteria had to be deliverable. Sector had to be able to demonstrate evidence to support the application. And Sport NI needed to have a way to ask for information that could be verified. So whilst evidence of imminent threat of closure wasn't one of the eligibility criteria, it was clearly an intended outcome um, that needed to be mitigated and evidence financial losses were used as the eligibility criteria to address this potential outcome. Okay, thank you for that. Then just to follow on from that then about the evidence of, of financial losses. Um, so very much this scheme, and correct me if I'm wrong, was based on the three years accounts and the, the difference in those accounts um, for last year compared to the, the two previous years, so as evidence of income loss. So it's of, of no great shock that we would see some of our larger, more prestigious clubs, no matter what sport that might be, um, receive much larger amounts than some of our smaller clubs out there because, of course, their losses are going to be greater um, because of their status. Um, you'd also then, I just want to then ask the question around you, I can't remember whether it was you, Catherine, or Antoinette, that had actually said other income generating activities when we talked about losses. I just want to know what are those losses? We know that there are, we have, know of gate receipts, we know maybe of membership, we know of competitions. What other losses? Would other losses include um, if there was a bar or a restaurant on the site of any of these clubs? Would other losses inclu include the gift shop or the pro shop? Um, just can you give us a list of what those full losses would be? It's, I assume it's not just um, gate receipts. No, and I'll start off, but John might want to feed in here. So yes, it, it will inc include lost hospitality, where, where that is part of, of the mechanism by which the sports club makes its earnings and on how it generates its income to invest in sport. Now, a separately constituted social club wouldn't form part of the scheme, but other types of hospitality losses would. Um, John, is there anything else you want to add in terms of the, of the losses that were being declared? The, uh, thanks, Catherine. The, the Chair has uh, listed a lot of the, the, the other forms of income already, uh, and the application form uh, that went out to the governing bodies uh, required all of the applicants to complete you know, where their income would normally come from and where it had come from in the last 12 months, and equally where their expenditure uh, was going out on. In some cases, what we're seeing that uh, the income depended on the nature of the, the structure of the organisation. So, if, if you take the example was given there of uh, of catering or of uh, hospitality uh, and, and, and bar sales, it depends very much on the way in which that organisation set up. As you said, if it was a separately constituted uh, social club, then that wouldn't have formed part of the club's accounts on a normal basis. So, therefore, wouldn't have been eligible under this uh, scheme. Uh, and in the same way, the example was given of a, of a pro shop. Uh, and in many uh, clubs, the pro shop it would be a franchised out uh, activity, so therefore wouldn't form part of the club's accounts. But in, in other circumstances, pro shops and some of those other uh, activities may well form part of the, the club's uh, annual accounts. So it would therefore have been part of, of this scheme as well. But we would have had evidence of that from within the application form from all of the governing bodies and all of the, the clubs. Okay, and then I suppose then just to follow on from that point as well. Then, um, so we know that that these all of these clubs were able to put down all of their financial losses right across the board. And then I think it was yourself, um, Antoinette, had mentioned then about um, that you'd looked at any other COVID funding that had been applied for or received. Um, I would imagine that some of those other parts within any sporting club. Um, may have been able to avail of other types of funding. Um, uh, just what was the uh, do you, can you tell us what was the percentage of crossover in any of that funding? Because there were various grants available, whether that was through through uh, the Department of Finance or through the Department of Economy. Um, what was the what, what was the results on that? Yeah, um, 
And let me start this and hand over to John again for the detail. Um, we did actually look um, at the whole range of funding made available across government um, um, in respect of COVID-19, and um, we netted that off the bottom um, the bottom line. We will also continue to look at um, clubs that may have been eligible for um, receipt of a range of government funding. John, do you might, maybe want to give a bit more detail? Yeah, I, I suppose, I, I, unfortunately, I'm going to say it will be impossible to give you one percentage. Uh, there were hundreds, as, as we've referred to in the opening remarks, there were over, it was 400 and, uh, 30 sports clubs that have been funded through the scheme and, uh, uh, and uh, 35 different uh, governing bodies have received funding. Every one of those, the amounts declared were different. So uh, it would be impossible to say that it was a set amount. But what we have been looking at it and we've been working with the uh, colleagues in the department and within the Department of Finance at a data matching exercise where we're, you know, for when we have looked at the amounts that we're making available to Sports Sustainability Fund, we're able to identify individual amounts of other COVID declared incomes. And even within Sport and I, we're able to do some of our own data matching uh, as well for some of our other schemes, like the Sports Hardship Fund. So, you know, we can see that if, if we know if we have given a club 2,000 or 3,000 pounds through Sports Hardship Fund, as a minimum, we would have expected to see that. We've also had information from the Department of Finance in respect of LRSS, and we've been able to do the minimum checking to see is at least that amount and then the other amounts that we're aware of has it been declared. And certainly, the, you know, look at at the uh, the information date, uh, it would take a lot of reassurance that those information has been a lot of information has been declared. But the amounts in many cases are much much uh, bigger than that. Uh, it'll you know it, there's it's evident that some clubs have been able to benefit from furlough payments as well, uh, and possibly some of the other schemes that were available from the Department for the Economy uh, back at the start of the the pandemic. Uh, that will be part of our due diligence checks as we you know as we work through uh, the the scheme and the, 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 this current financial year and this new financial year and, and work towards close down of the scheme, but uh, those due diligence checks as to what all those component parts are made up. And there's a much wider uh, data matching exercise going on across uh, the, uh, uh, the executive across government departments. Okay, um, and I suppose we, we'll, we, we'll get all of that um, evidence as, as time goes on, depending on what the committee want to do after this meeting today. Um, I, I, I then just want to go on to, the, to do with the sports governing bodies, and we know that they were part of the, pro the process and the co-design of, of, of this scheme. Um, it were, at any stage, and I'm asking this of Sport NI, and I'm asking this of you, Antoinette, at, at any stage, were, were there warning signs flagged up to you where there was a lack of funding proposals coming in? You will know, for, if you've been listening to this committee since January, um, this committee very much has focused on many of those sporting clubs that did not apply to the Sports Sustainability Fund because of the issues around LRSS. Um, and I, I, I would look at, for one example at looking at, I think it's the Irish Bowls Association, where only four clubs applied for funding through the Sports Sustainability Fund. Um, when we know there, are, I couldn't begin to, I, I suppose, count how many bowling clubs we have in Northern Ireland. It's a very, very popular sport. Um, did that, you know, whenever you see other clubs, the like, of GAA and football and rugby, which we would expect to be in the high numbers, absolutely would expect that. Um, but I would also have expected other sports to have been high numbers as well. Um, so your conversations with all of those governing bodies, were they all completely equal in getting that message out? And were you shocked and surprised at some of the, of, of some of the, the results that came back? What I would say, Chair, is that um the sports sector is a very diverse sector, as you um, referred to um, just earlier in this session. Um, we have had, for example, um, as you said, some of our bigger governing bodies, we, uh, with the proliferation of clubs, we would have expected um, more, um, more clubs coming in. But in terms of our communication, we held a range of um, uh, webinars with the sector. Right across the sector, we had um, numbers in the 70s, 80s um, attending from right across sports. Um, so we provided information equally accessible right across the sector. <coughs> and um, we, held, um, we held workshops in relation to the sustainability fund. We supported those smaller governing bodies who may not have had the same capacity as the bigger governing bodies in terms of accessing the fund. And there were very different 
um, considerations given by different sports. For example, um, Netball and I um, took a decision um, with the governing body and its um, sports clubs that this, the Sports Hardship Fund had already sustained the clubs and what was therefore needed um, was a sustaining of the governing body so that it could continue to support those clubs and therefore Netball and I, only the governing body come in. In other, um, in another example in other sports is that where activities were reduced or non-existent as a result of COVID-19 and as a result of the restrictions and the lockdowns, it wasn't, um, it wasn't necessary to um, provide funding, particularly where the um, clubs didn't own their own premises, for example, or weren't paying rent. And therefore, no activity um, meant um, very, very little expenditure. So there were a whole range of considerations taken into account in relation to that. I'm happy for John, if you want to give more detail on that, John. Uh, yeah, thanks, Antoinette. I uh, suppose, so, uh, Chair, just just said about yeah, you uh, wouldn't begin to, to guess at the number of clubs. As far as I know, the, the, in terms of the Irish Bowling uh, Federation, which takes in uh, or all of the the different governing bodies for, within bowls, indoor and outdoor, short mat and what have you. I think there's about a hundred uh, clubs in, in Northern Ireland, and, and within that uh, that wider bowls sector. Uh, certainly, there was. Uh, there's 48 bowls clubs have come in through uh, the likes of had received support through uh, the the COVID safe sports packs and four botcha clubs in there as well. Uh, we've had uh, 25 clubs that we've been able to support uh, through the sports hardship fund, and then we had nine funded applications through uh, the sports sustainability fund. So I suppose it was. I mean, that was one of the things that are in terms of messaging to governing bodies and to the sector at the very start of the scheme. Uh, was presenting sports sustainability fund as part of an overall suite of interventions that it wasn't just the you know the single response that there had been a range of other interventions in the previous uh, eight months at that point when the, when the scheme was launched in December. I suppose just what I'm asking you is, do you think that some governing bodies did better than others at getting their message out there to their members? I think, Chair, where we have. Um, larger governing bodies um, with um, a lot of human infrastructure it is you're absolutely right it is easier for those governing bodies to apply those human resources um, in comparison or contrast for example to smaller governing bodies who are either relying heavily on volunteers and one or two of the smaller ones who are predominantly <coughs> volunteer driven so yes that could well have made a difference that could have made a difference what I would say is that um, we designed the scheme and we designed all of our communications, both written, both verbal, um, using all of our social media platforms, our website, um, face to face, virtual face to face through Zoom, and actually um, capability support through our own officers to those smaller governing bodies. We actually um, put in place a whole range of communication and support. Um, and that was targeted mainly at the smaller governing bodies who didn't have that capacity. Okay, thank you, Antoinette. Um, I, I have I have a, a raft of more questions, but I'm not going to hog it and get accused of, of asking everything, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but I just want to ask just one more question around those, those sports clubs, and it would be for the departments, and I don't know if you're able to answer this or not. Um, you will know that this committee had written has written to the minister, the department, the finance minister as well, about those various sports clubs that have fallen through the net. And it is, I mean, it is important that we fight on their behalf uh, as well, because when they have seen some of the amounts of money that have gone to various sports clubs through Northern Ireland, and they have received absolutely nothing um, because of the the, the mix-up and the debacle around the LRSS. Um, so I suppose just to ask the department, are we any further forward on, on, on helping those clubs at all and any conversations you've had with the Department of Finance? Yeah, Chair, I mean, we're aware that um, both as the restrictions continue to impact the sector, there's going to be a continued financial need, as well as the financial need that's already there for those clubs that, as you say, have fallen between the gaps. So there are some clubs that chose not to apply or couldn't evidence financial losses, but there's also clubs that didn't apply because they'd submitted an application to, for example, LRSS. We have had ongoing conversations with DOF, and we've been doing a data matching exercise. Um, it appears that there's approximately 70 sports clubs that, that were paid LRSS. Of those, 26 also applied for the Sports Sustainability Fund. So work is ongoing to analyse those clubs that have fallen between the gap. 
and we'll provide advice to the minister on the need to secure further funding to sustain these clubs as we move forwards. Well, well, I suppose that, that what you're telling me is it's really quite positive that those conversations are continuing because we, are, we as a committee, are continuing to get correspondence from those clubs. I didn't realise it was as many as 70 um, that that this affects. Um, you know, I suppose the committee would probably be aware of maybe 20 or so um, clubs, but that is a vast amount of clubs that, because of the of the LRSS and the decision making around that which was, uh, you know, in, in many cases, was too late for them actually to apply then for the Sports Sustainability Fund. Um, you know, so therefore there, that responsibility falls on us all, um, not just on the sports club. Um, so at, that, at least that's a little bit more positive news and something definitely the committee will want to updates on um, when that is available. I'm going to open up to members and then I do have more questions um, and if they're not covered, I'll come back to them. So I have Kelly, I have Sinead and I have Alex. So any other member, let me know if they want to come in. So I'll go to you first, Kelly. Can I bring Kelly in? There we go. Thank you very much, Chair, and, and thank you to all um, who are here today to give us evidence. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying that while there has been media coverage um, about this, um, the amounts of money that have been given out, um, I don't have particularly have an issue with that because the larger the club and the larger the organisation, um, then the more costs that they would have and their expenses therefore would be higher. Um, but I just want to tease out some of those questions that you can imagine that um, others have asked and we have the opportunity now to, to discuss with you. Um, as many of you know, um, I worked in the community and voluntary sector before I became an MLA. I am fully aware of how detailed application forms can be in the red tape that are involved with them. And having been a, a person who actually issued grants on behalf of a government department at one stage, um, I know the hoops, Antoinette, that Sport NI has had to go through with that. So to start off with, there has been an allegation that clubs, um, some governing bodies and, and some clubs would have lots of reserves. How were they considered within this application and um, how were they accounted for? So if I can ask that first. Okay, if I if I maybe start, then I suspect Antoinette or John might want to jump in. So um, the sustainability fund was really designed to meet the needs of the whole sports sector in a dynamic environment of constant change. So there were a number of factors considered and um, the complexity of determining what was and wasn't a reserve that could be accessed by an organization what might be considered a reasonable amount of reserves for attention, obviously the time constraints, the urgency of the funding. And for those reasons, the decision was taken not to include an assessment of reserves as part of the, the current financial losses at that time. And um, so to this end, the process was really designed to remove subjectivity. Every applicant was treated equally. Nobody was disadvantaged, including those who'd built reserves over a number of years for specific development purposes. I don't know, Antoinette or John, if you want to add anything more specific on that. Uh, Catherine, if I'd come in, I suppose it's, um, you, you have, you've touched on some of the, the complexity around reserves and uh, it, members will be aware of, of those as well. But just, uh, I suppose it is just uh, reiterating it, is that when, when people think of reserves, they think of a big sum of money, and uh, as you know, as we were conscious, you know, knowing the way the, the sports sector is is uh, is set up and the way clubs are set up and the way governing bodies in some cases they may appear to be asset rich but those assets may not actually be something that can be monetized very easily uh, a lot of those assets and those reserves may be tied up within the facilities uh, it certainly it wouldn't have been our intention to undermine the sector by causing or by requiring assets to be disposed of before public monies could be made available uh, equally, uh, uh, assets may be even if they're cash assets, they may be restricted reserves that have been uh, that have been secured over a number of years from members from within fund fundraising and local community activities for a specific purpose, and that may be because clubs, governing bodies have been very prudent in their financial planning. Uh, are looking towards capital replacement of assets. That could be uh, replacement of vehicles. It could be if they have a, if they have a fleet of vehicles, uh, if they have uh, land that needs to be maintained, if they have facilities that need to be upgraded. And certainly, we know that you know much more generally there is you know there are challenges around infrastructure and around modernising the sports infrastructure uh, in the years ahead. So again, looking at reserves, it, the intention was never to. Uh, penalise those clubs and those sports that have been prudent in their planning and that have been making that provision uh, for the future. And actually, that provision that would be critical 
uh, in terms of the sport starting to build back better in, in the years ahead. So I think it's just from my point of view, just to make it clear so it's on the record and having worked with reserves myself in the past, as you say, people presume that this is money that's being saved and it's there for a rainy day and can be spent on any purpose. But actually reserves, as you have said, um, John, they are restricted. So they're paying for redundancies. They could be paying for closing costs. They could be paying for costs for selectors if you had to close an organisation. And as you say, then you have responsibilities. I know in the community and voluntary sector, we were always encouraged to have running costs for three to six months so that if you did, if it really got to a bad state where you did have to close down, you were still going to be operational for a period of time while that happened. Um, so to be honest, I used to yeah. get complaints all the time and, and where I worked because where we, we did actually save up reserves to replace buses on a straight line depreciation over a period of seven years. So it looked as if we were cash rich um, when in actual fact that money was all accounted for. It was decided by an independent, you know, the board of trustees, the board of directors who identified the money. So I, I just wanted to make it clear that when somebody talks about somebody having millions in the bank, um, unless they're um, something very unusual in Northern Ireland, normally every penny of that is accounted for. And that actually could be for future development, say, for instance, a youth sport or part of the, the grounds need to be improved. So I have no problem with that. So thank you for that. Um, as you said, the, the grant was to sustain and secure the sector. Um, and it was a fund of last resort. And you have spelled out that other grants, for instance, the hardship fund, rates relief, other COVID grants weren't allowed, they would have been deducted because they would have covered some of the costs. Um, so I just want to tease out again about, um, Catherine, you might be able to help me with this one on the, the sports sustainability fund objectives. Because as the committee, we know everything was done in knee jerk. It was done very quickly, and thank you for that, because the quicker we could get the money out, post sport and I, to get out to the governing bodies, the, the more we could save, or the more clubs we could save from going under. But um, just to tease it out, now I'd identified it was one of the things that we knew as a committee was coming forward, that this was the fund of last resorts, and that imminent threat of closure was included. So Sport NI did what they did with the application form, but before it got that far, obviously there was a differential between the business plan that was submitted to get the money out um, and what was in the application form. So I just want to tease out, was that a decision that was taken um, with the department, with Sport NI and with the governing bodies? Because we all know if this money hadn't gone out the door, we would have seen many famous clubs and teams closed. Um, we would have seen very famous golf clubs closed. We would have seen um, opportunities for sports coming back after all of this, not there anymore. Um, so I just want to tease out when that changed or when that, that priority was just, you talked about Catherine, um, when you looked through the actual, you know, when it was going out to Sport NI for the application process, that there was a, it was down to three options at that stage, wasn't it? You identified those. Yeah, so I mean, we had a series of objectives set out through the screening objectives and uh, sorry, the screening documents, and indeed they are still in the business plan. But really, what we were trying to pull together was the overarching objectives of the scheme. So that overarching objective was to secure and sustain. So that resulted in the, the two final objectives that are set out in the business case, which were about minimising financial stress and um, due to lost income as a result of COVID and again about preparing to return to sport following the end of the COVID restrictions. And I suppose it's not that those were lost in the application form, it's just that they had to be operationalized. So we had to have an eligibility criteria that, that, could, be, that could be managed, that um, the applicants could provide evidence for, that Sport NI could seek evidence for. So it was a co-design process between Sport NI, ourselves and the sector in terming, in determining how, how we might do that in the most expedient way, but still maintaining, obviously, the principles of good governance. Yeah, no, I, that, that's, I'm, I'm satisfied with that. And, and I know my, my heart goes out to sport and I haven't been out there and um, had a, a, a department breathing down my neck to get grants out. And it's not an easy job and it's not an easy job for the department to actually try to get this money out in such a crisis period. But I want to go then, my, I'm coming to my last questions. I don't have very many for you. There has been um, a person who's been in contact with, with many of the MLAs who has put claims there. Now I have challenged that person and said that I, I think that they should be a whistleblower and they should come forward with their information um, on a formal basis. I think they're claiming that they have tried to, but we'll 
will let them deal with that one. Um, there has been an allegation made um, about Cycling Ireland, and I appreciate that Sport NI did their job. That there may well have been a guesstimate application went in. Um, it was confirmed those events weren't happening, and a, and a variant was put forward. All normal things that happen with grants. Um, but there was a, an allegation made, as I say, from this person who who's still anonymous, um, that for instance, Cycling Ireland um, didn't have to provide the financial evidence and a token amount was paid towards them. So just help us as a committee to understand how that could or couldn't happen. Um, John, before I'm going to let John cover the application, but just in, in terms of the, of the whistleblower, the department has been made aware of concerns expressed allegedly. So we will obviously be following that up through our whistleblowing processes. Um, and John, I'll hand over to you in terms of handling the application form itself. Yeah, well, so I can just say categorically at the outset, any awards that have been approved under Sports Sustainability Fund are based on, on evidence net losses through the same consistent application pro forma. So the, uh, you, you've, you've mentioned the, the site in Ireland and the, the initial requested amount and the, and the final paid amount. Uh, the, the final requested amount that we've paid out is based on the same evidence uh, information that's been provided by each of the other awards that has been approved through Sports Sustainability Fund. Uh, we've no doubt that that uh, governing bodies, you know, we had to go back to a number of governing bodies sometimes for clarifications in terms of information that came in. And uh, Kelly, you've already mentioned the, you know, sometimes the the, the level of understanding uh, amongst uh, you know often volunteers that may be completing application forms. I must say, in, in, in Cycling Ireland's case, it wasn't necessarily volunteers that they, they have staff there, but it was a, it was about trying to get a, an application pro forma that was going to be applicable across all sports, so that there was a consistent approach uh, to every sport, that there was no subjectivity involved in the assessment. Uh, it was trying to make it as objective and as transparent the whole way through. The information that and the clarifications that came back from Cycling Ireland allowed us to determine the, uh, I think it was 14,518 pounds. Don't hold me to the exact figures. I haven't got the, I haven't, I'm not reading those off the screen, but the 14,000 uh, uh, pounds sum that was uh, approved for uh, Cycling Ireland that went out to them in the letter of offer, that's evidence based. It's not uh, a gratuity payment, it's not a goodwill payment. By any stretch of the imagination, and certainly, you know, how it is, you know, the integrity of the process has been applied consistently to every one of the applications that we've assessed through the scheme. And just to double check on that one, then, if if there was anything that you guys felt like there was an application had been made, there was evidence provided, the money went out the door, but actually, when you check it in a later stage, that the money hasn't been able to be whatever has changed the money hasn't been able to there's an opportunity to recoup those costs or recoup that grant uh, absolutely sorry I, mean, I don't mean to be jumping in there but absolutely I mean, our, our, our letter of offer uh, contains specific terms and conditions uh, and those terms and conditions have explicit provision for uh, the ability for uh, sport and i to you know to pursue and recover uh, any all or part of the award that's been paid out if it's used uh, for something other than the purposes for which it was given okay thank you um i know that the chair's already asked about capacity building with some of those small smaller sporting bodies and particularly mentioned bowls um i'm just thinking if if there's anything that we could do to lever more money to be able to help those organisations, um, even in their capacity building going forward. I think that would be something I would certainly support investment with yourselves with. Um, that's all my questions at the moment. So um, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Chair. Sorry, go ahead. Chair, sorry, is it possible if I just want to add um, and respond to um, Kelly as well? Just in terms of the whistleblowing, Catherine's absolutely um, right. Like the Department for Communities, we take seriously. Um, any concerns the staff may have to raise in relation to um, allegations, which you quite rightly said we should consider as part of whistleblowing. Um, Sport and I has reissued our very clear whistleblowing policy and procedures to all staff. We have um, provided a briefing um, since um, we've, um, we've been made aware through media reports um, of that issue. We have provided staff with uh, a commitment that staff who um, wish to raise concerns will be supported and will be protected within the whistleblowing um, um, policy. 
What I can say at this stage is that there were some media reports last week um, in relation to Sport and I locking down systems and locking staff out of systems. I can confirm that that absolutely didn't happen, that there were no systems locked down at any stage um, since the Sports Sustainability Fund or indeed any other fund um, was open. We have a very clear value in Sport and I of transparency and openness. And um, we have also confirmed that there's been absolutely no failed attempts to access systems um, by relevant staff in Sport and I. Um, the other thing that I would want to um, welcome, Kelly, is what you've just said in relation to capability building um, for smaller governing bodies and smaller clubs, because we all know we're working with a very diverse sector and some people have greater capability than, other, um, than others. Um, we, are, we have opened and I has opened our national lottery um, COVID recovery program um, at Build Back Better. And that's we waited on that because we wanted to actually sustain the sector before we could start bringing in the, the, um, the creativity element of, the, of building back better. And we have four capability strands there that range from financial planning um, right through to connectivity between clubs and communities and government bodies and clubs and additional support on top of our current support for mental health and well-being, additional support. And that's not going to governing bodies, that's going to governing bodies and clubs throughout Northern Ireland. And there's more information on our website on that. And we'd be more than happy to provide more. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Kelly. Thanks. Um, can we then bring in Sinead, please? Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Can indeed. Yes, go ahead. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks thanks to uh, Catherine, Antoinette, um, John and Tony for uh, for coming today. And I want to, you know, we've heard serious amounts of positive feedback about the scheme. Um, I just want to put on record my thanks to you guys and all the departmental officials who, you know, did Trojan work to get this support out to the sector. It's been a vital lifeline for them. And certainly there's been a tremendous amount of, of positive feedback about it. I just want to make a point about maybe um, what we're doing here and, and probably how we got here. And I think it's important to say that, you know, I, I find some of the comments made at the start of this meeting a bit bizarre. Um, you know, there was no mass media scrutiny around this. Um, over the last week, there's been very limited commentary by some who, to be quite honest, uh, in my opinion, seem set on turning a positive intervention into something that it's not. Um, and the negative int intent and focus on uh, this issue by very limited media people, I, um, I believe has not been done out of any concern for sport, uh, grassroots or otherwise. I think it's politically motivated um, to engineer an opportunity to score political points. Um, and in turn, that has demonized the golf fraternity. Um, you know, and, and why is that? Because golf is viewed as a rich person's sport. You know, what, what sort of signal does that send? So I think it's important to say that journalists have no right to demonize sport of any code. Um, and I think the sport governing bodies will be very disappointed um, if members of this committee allow themselves to become uh, complicit in any attempt to demonise sport and sports clubs. Um, I'm certainly unsure why this has happened. And, you know, the sports sector really should not be made to feel guilty for seeking support um, that they were entitled to, um, support to recoup the losses um, of this global pandemic. So um, I do welcome uh, the opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to speak to officials today. Um, and I suppose in terms of, of questions that I would have, um, you know, I think looking from the different governing bodies and organisations um, and taking the sector as a whole, you know, would it be fair to say that the, the feedback has been extremely um, positive? And maybe uh, the departmental officials and, and Sport and I can confirm that the majority of the feedback um, on the Sports Sustainability Fund has been of a positive nature. Absolutely, Sinead. And I'm going to hand over to Antoinette because I know she's had very close contact with a lot of the governing bodies and she'll be able to give you more details. Um, thanks, Catherine. Um, thanks, Sinead. Um, we have actually been really humbled, if I'm being honest, with the support that we have got from the sector and um, from the smallest governing body right up to um, our big commercial interests in, in rugby. Um, IFA, um, GEA, golf, um, boxing to name just, um, just a few. Um, we have had some fairly um, emotional responses to the funding that's been received um, just this week. 
um, I heard from a, um, a sport and governing body leader who um, rang, who took the time to ring in and thank the staff and thank Sport and I thank the Department for Communities. But what I heard was that um, he had made a call to a, a particular club chair um, to say that you've been awarded funding from Sport and I, and that chair burst into tears and said that um, they were going that evening to a meeting to um, recommend closure of the club because it could no longer be sustained and actually redundancy of their, their, their only paid coach. So that's that's been the impact um, of the funding and all of that funding has been um, evidence-based as John and Catherine have so clearly said and nobody has received any funding that they um, could not show losses for um, and this is very much sustaining a sector. We have some of our governing bodies and some of our sports clubs and um, Paula Chair you have, have already indicated the clubs that have received nothing and um, we know that Ulster Rugby continues to struggle um, and still has um, real problems with demonstrating going concern status. So I've just told you one story. There are multiple stories where we have been able um, to make a very different impact. If the executive of the minister had not made this funding available, um, the sector would not be in a position to support Northern Ireland recovering from COVID. Chair, could uh, I come in there on that? And uh, Sinead? From the outset, the Minister made it very clear to us that this scheme was to be open and transparent. And that was something that has uh, been a theme throughout the schemes that have been run to support the sector from the Hardship Fund right through. There's a dashboard that's published and updated on the Hardship Fund that covers what people have received. And this was about transparency. What people asked for and what people received was there, it was published, and that was something the Minister made very clear from the outset when we, when we set about um, defining this. Kelly had touched on the time scales, and in preparation for this, when we reflected back on the time scales from, um, and if I take a point in time, NIFL presented their report to the Department on the 5th of October and to the Committee on the 15th of October. From there to, to the scheme launching on the 4th of December, I mean, to put together the documentation and to go through the proper checks and balances to do that and do it correctly uh, took a significant team effort and it was unprecedented in my experience. I mean, I, I have to pay a credit to the people in Sport NA. Uh, I have to pay a credit to the people in governing bodies who were at the end of the phone for us when we were trying to come up with a solution for the very challenging position that they find themselves in. And also, I'd like to pay a tribute to my own team. You know, people say that it, there's a team of people here. The team of a small number of people within the department who have worked all hours, been available to engage over a, a six week period. And then to the guys who delivered this on the ground, the, gover the clubs, the governing bodies, to get this on the ground by the end of March was a significant achievement. Absolutely was, Tony. <clears throat> and I know just, you know, anecdotally here locally, the, the sports teams that and clubs that I would be dealing with, um, you know, without this, you know, they'd be in a really, really hopeless situation. And we know, you know, Catherine outlined it very well at the start there. We know how important um, it is going to be, not just to help us out of the pandemic, but post pandemic um, for our health, our mental health and well-being, but also from a social uh, point of view as well. Um, getting out and about and, and having that social interaction with people. Um, I only have a couple of questions, but my next one would be just in terms of the the administration process. Because um, as I said during my, my open remarks there, there has been very limited um, negative commentary. Um, but, you know, could, could the department outline if any issues with, with um, the administration process has come to their attention? No, I mean, I suppose the, prim the primary issue around the administration was the timing, Sinead. So the scheme was launched on the 4th of December. It was coming into the Christmas break. It's something that was out with our control, but obviously added increased pressure, both to the teams in, in Sport NI and in governing bodies and clubs. You had to prepare the information at a time when maybe they wouldn't ordinarily have been at the workplace. So in response to this, the deadline for um, closure was actually put forward to the 20th of January. 
think it was originally set, John, correct me if I'm wrong, was it the 11th of January? Uh, fourth. It was fourth, fourth, of January? fourth or fifth, fifth yeah. of January, I think we were giving people a day after the new year. Yeah, yeah. so we agreed that we would push the deadline forward and we would try to absorb some of that time at our end in terms of getting the money out through the door and getting the checks and processes gone through quicker. So I think that, that was the main issue with the administrative processes. I, mean, I think it was Kelly alluded to as well, you know, filling in application forms for grants are bread and butter for some people, but not to others. So for some people, it was probably a relatively smooth process. For others, they probably needed a bit more assistance, but John and his team would have been at the end of the phone to help them through that. I don't know, John, is there anything came through to you? No, I mean, there was nothing that came through other than it was, we recognised the effort that all of the governing bodies were putting in. Some governing bodies, yes, you know, may have had staff to help to organise that, but every governing body was ultimately relying on volunteers and those were vol you know volunteers who put themselves on the line over christmas over new year and that was why whenever the request came in uh, to extend the closing date that certainly we wanted to do everything that we could to you know to facilitate and enable uh, that that request uh, it was recognizing the, the length that those you know the, the the people within those clubs were going to be going to to gather the information and then equally the 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 the, the, tro the, the phrase used trojan efforts that staff within governing bodies went to as well to collate that and that was this was governing bodies showing that leadership and showing that uh, responsibility and, and and sense of ownership of the scheme as well because that i suppose when we, we've used the phrase co-design and co-design almost makes it sound like it was something that happened up to the point when the scheme launched and then you know it, it stopped actually the the the, the spirit of co-design has continued the whole way through the scheme not not just up to the launch date but through the uh, the the the, the phase when the, the scheme was opened to applications and even subsequent to the, the, the assessment process, where we've been working very closely with governing bodies. And you know, I know sometimes we have been going back and setting very challenging de uh, deadlines for uh, governing bodies to come back to us with a response so that we can get the information. But they equally have understood that the reason we've set those challenging uh, response timelines is because we're keen to get the money out to them as quickly as possible because the overriding message when we were spoken, speaking to governing bodies, speaking to sports back before Christmas was every day that this money is sitting in public accounts is a day when it's not getting into the, the accounts of clubs and into sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, just, I, I think either Kelly or, or the chair have covered this already, but just so I'm clear um, in my own, my own head, uh, Referring to the um, the threat of, of imminent closure as a criteria for the funding scheme, I think you you guys have said that you know while it was um, included in the criteria, that was not the defining um, criteria. The de defining criteria was indeed net COVID losses, and that uh, that that clawback mechanism is available um, if you know if, if it transpires that. Um, you know, governing bodies or clubs aren't aren't using the the money for the, uh, the, the you know the way it was intended. That clawback option is is there. It's part of the um, the business case. It's part of the uh, it's part of the agreement the clubs would have had to sign up to um, on, on on receipt of this funding. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Removing the imminent threat of closure, I suppose, is an intended outcome rather than the criteria by which we assess the applications. So obviously something we want to avoid and the criteria were set in such a way as to, to up, up manage the scheme in such a way to hopefully prevent that. And sorry, the clawback, yes, absolutely, Sinead. If it comes to light that um, there's been any misuse of public funds, absolutely, Sport and I have, have the right to claw that back. So, Sinead, if I can just finish on the, on the business case, I mean, the programme aims stated in the business case were about sustaining governing bodies and clubs, building club resilience, maintaining facilities and protecting jobs. I think that summarises what it was that we were trying to do for the sector. Yeah, listen, that's that's really all for me. I'm just, you know, I'm glad that we were, you know, through this question and answer, answer session that we've been able to help confirm the governance of, of this scheme and, and in fact the due diligence of the scheme. Um, and I just think it's important to reiterate um, that the sports sector is well deserving of this much needed support. Um, and it, it certainly, you know, this committee will look forward to working with the sector, um, you know, as we uh, emerge from recovery and, and post recovery. So thank you very much for your time today. Okay, thank you, Sinead. 
Um, I then have Alex, then Karen, then Mark. So I'll go to Alex. Go ahead, Alex. I, uh, oh, sorry, Robin, you wanted to. Yeah. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you for your submission so far. And um, certainly the Sports Sustainable Fund has been fantastic. And um, every sports club that's, that's got it um, deeply welcomes it. And we're, we're glad that that money has got out to the sports club. Um, what I would say is you know, nobody is demonising any club, certainly not from this committee that I've heard. Um, but I do think as, as a committee we do have a right to hold the department to account. Um, and there shouldn't be any attempts to stop us from being able to do that. Um, and there have been questions raised, uh, certainly not by me, but they have been raised in, in the public. Um, and we as a committee do need that to uh, question the department about that. Um, so um, while um, we were discussing um, this so far, we were talking about the criteria and the threat of closure, the net losses and the clash flow difficulties. And I think um, Kelly touched on about the reserves. And what I want to know about the reserves, well, I think, um, reserves can be tied up um, and it, it could be cash but it's tied up maybe for different things but there may be reserves there also that could be quite substantial that are not tied up and could be used do, do you not think that we we should have do you not think the department should have looked at the criteria to examine those reserves just to see exactly if there was potential for someone that maybe could have been used. Uh, I'm not saying they could have, and I'm not saying it shouldn't have allowed people to apply for grants uh, from the sports world, but if there was substantial reserves that could have been used, do you not think the department should have known about that? Um, I would maybe start off, Alex, if that's okay. So we had we touched on the fact that the scheme was really designed to meet the needs of the whole sector um, and the complexities around reserves and i know john provided some further clarity around um you know restricted reserves and unrestricted reserves i suppose what i would say is that obviously the delivery was undertaken in a very dynamic and fluid environment as with any emergency response it's inevitable that we're going to have lessons to learn and that we will look to consider this moving forward and indeed that work has already started to take place um, in terms of um, the work that the permanent secretary has been engaging with internal audit. And also DSC and Sport NI will also undertake a lessons learned and a post-project evaluation as we move forwards. Um, John or Antoinette, did you want to add to that? Uh, I, well, I, I, it's repeating uh, probably uh, our what you've and uh, said are underscoring what, what you said, Catherine, that the reserves issue was something that it was, you know, we discussed that, we talked about it, we looked at there were, there were pros and cons. We have no doubt that, you know, we're, we're a learning organisation and we're, we're committed to trying to make things better as we go along, uh, you know, through all of our programmes. Uh, in terms of putting together a project team, I mean, we, we brought together people who have the experience of finance, of governance and of grant schemes and who understand the complexity of putting together these grant programmes and who equally who understood the timelines that would be associated with assessment. And the time is something that we've talked about and the, the, uh, the constrained window of opportunity to get the, the scheme on the ground and out uh, to where it was needed within the sector. So the, it, was, it, would be, uh, it, it would be wrong for people to think that reserves wasn't part of the discussion. It was part of the discussion. And those, you know, the pros and the cons as to why you wouldn't, why you wouldn't, were all weighed up. And again, coming back to the principles of the program about having, you know, a, you know, a simple, transparent process that was going to be applied consistently to bigger sports and more capable sports, and maybe smaller sports that were volunteer-led and that mightn't have you know, the same systems. That it was the principles of the program ultimately were the thing that helped to shape, you know, that same consistent uh, application process. Uh, so reserves was part of the discussion, uh, and so the decision that we took at that time was informed by the times that we were in and the, the pressures that, that the sector was under at that stage, but they were all taken in the context of, of good governance principles and the, uh, the principles of the scheme. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm not um, discounting what you're saying, 
but ju just in some of the language that you're using um, about pros and cons and lessons being learnt and stuff like this, uh, do, do you accept then that there were maybe some issues that um, you would have done differently? And if so, what are they? Because I, you, I you, think you are mentioning about lessons learning and pros and cons and, and stuff, stuff like that. I, I think it would be uh, both impossible and foolish to suggest that we could run a scheme of this scale in these timeframes and, and not learn lessons from it and not with hindsight think maybe we could have done X, Y or Z differently. I think at the moment we don't know what we would or could have done differently but it's something that we will, of course, look to. I mean, it was an unprecedented circumstance. It was an emergency scheme in the middle of a global pandemic. Hopefully we will never find ourselves in that position again, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to take the learning from the way we develop this and indeed all the COVID release schemes to make sure we can feed this into our work going forward. And actually, I suppose one of the pieces that came through quite strongly was the co-design piece and how well it worked. So I think that's something we would be looking to mainstream into, into all our work as we move forwards. So I think, you know, there will undoubtedly be debt lessons to learn and, you know, we will reach the point where we understand those better over the coming weeks and months. Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier, I'm not sure which one of you did, <laughs> about um, clubs that maybe got other funding streams um, on, on the COVID crisis. Um, how many clubs received other funding and if they did, did this impact on them getting the, the funding for the sports sustainable funding or did it reduce the amount they would have got? How, how did that work out? Did that, does that make sense? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose, uh, Alex, in a, in, a, in a nutshell, anybody that received funding from another source should have declared it on their application form and it would have reduced the amount they were eligible for from the Sports Sustainability Fund. So that should all be feeding through the application forms. I, I can't give you a figure and I, I think John said earlier he, he couldn't at the moment either as to exactly how much other COVID related funding the clubs and governing bodies had received. Though it, it's information I guess that could be gathered from the forms but absolutely it should have been discounted and the um, amount that they claimed from the SSF should have been reduced accordingly. Is there any of the bodies or sporting clubs that you're looking to recoup any money from? Is, is there any that you've, you've looked at yet that there may have been difficulties? If I, if I uh, can come in another, if colleagues don't mind, uh, the, the answer to that is no, we're not, we're not at this stage in the process of recouping funds. Uh, we're continuing to pay out uh, you know, we've, we've, we've made off the, the letters of offer uh, at this stage, which we're delighted with, uh, and the, the money is continuing to flow out uh, to sports clubs and to the sports sector. There will be a due diligence process and a vouching process that will be ongoing over the next number of months. Uh, and as we work through that, uh, through those due diligence processes, at that stage, then that's that's when, uh, you know, if we if we need to invoke any of the clawback. Uh, clauses within the terms and conditions, we will have the opportunity uh, to do that. Uh, but it, it's you know we, until we get into due diligence, it would be uh, sort of wrong of me to, to uh, presuppose that that will be something that we'll have to do. Okay, so nothing's been identified anyway as as of yet. That's what you're saying. Okay, mm -hmm. that's great. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Alex. Thank you. Um, can I then ask broadcasting to bring or to take Sinead out of spotlight and in the audience and bring in Karen, please? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Tony, Catherine, John, and Antoinette for coming along this morning. Um, a lot of it has been covered, so I'll, I'll try not to go over it. Um, but um, just following on from Sinead, there, I just remembered the morning that this was announced and. And uh, I was walking the dog and on the local radio, the cricket clubs, the local cricket clubs were on. And I was just smiling, listening to them because they were just talking about how wonderful it was. Um, and I want to thank the department and Sport NA and the staff there. And as Tony, Tony said, the team effort and command you saw. Um, I, like Kelly, come from a community and voluntary background. So I understand in relation to the level of work that goes into grant aid, trying to get it right, get it out, get the support out. Um, it's very, very critical. So I want to thank you and commend you all for that. And I also want to commend the governing bodies as well. Um, I declare an interest as a secretary of a boxing club. 
Um, I, so I did see uh, the the great work that was being done, um, particularly by our own governing body at a grassroots level, and the support, the communication, and the feedback that was offered to us. Um, as a local club, we we decided not to apply. Just as Antoinette had said, we didn't. We 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 just took the decision. We're volunteer led. Um, uh, we had no activity going on. We don't pay rent. Um, so there is varying reasons across the different um, groups and across the sectors. You know, uh, as has already been touched on, varying uh, capacity uh, within clubs. We just can't say, you know, that every club had the capacity to apply and all the different reasons. So, but I think that has has been covered um, in relation to it. As I say, most of it has been covered, and um, I know Catherine, you touched there there in relation of um, was it emergency scheme and following on what we have done things differently. And hindsight's a wonderful thing. So maybe just the question. Um, should there have been a cap placed on their level of funding? Um, uh, if somebody wants to answer that. Thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, so again, I mean, the scheme was designed to meet the needs of the whole sector. So we did discuss a cap, but it would have been to the minister, given the range of the eligible field, variations in the estimated level of financial various organizations. Just stop breaking up on us a little bit. I don't know whether it's your microphone or what it is. You're going in and out a wee bit. Just if you can oh, try again. Sorry, I'll do, do like Antoinette and move closer to the microphone. <laughs> um, so really, there was a vast range of governing bodies, uh, you know, from the very large entities right down to very small grassroots clubs, large amateur organisations and the likes of Ulster Rugby and the Belfast Giants. So, I mean, the reality behind imposing a monetary limit would have restricted the net losses and would have had a negative impact on the aims of the scheme. So from the outset, the scheme design was an application process, which included providing evidence of losses, and that was to secure and sustain the sector. But like I've already said, you know, we will review, we'll look back and we'll see what lessons can be learned. Um, and again, John, I, I feel like I always hand over to you for the last word, but is there anything you want to add? Well, it's, uh, the only thing I would say, the, the the idea of of a cap it was something that was part of the, the 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 design development discussions early on and one of the things that we were always mindful of was sometimes you know putting something in that ends up having unintended consequences um, but you know when you don't know what everybody is going to ask for so uh, so is that, I'm uh, I'm happy to say that you know if, if people have more questions about it they can sort of certainly happy to elaborate on that if need be. No. Thank you for that, John. And I think as we've heard here from all of you this morning, as you know, um, the evidence had to be produced and it was an open and transparent uh, process and there is uh, procedures there to review um, and recoup. So thank you for that. Just because I just wanted to finish to say, like we all know that sport does it's not only uh, vital to our health and well-being, but we've clearly heard here today it's an employer and an economic driver, and um, the, it was very much welcomed. Not just this scheme, but all the the, the the level of supports that has been made available by yourselves in the department. So thank you for that. Okay, thank you, Karen. Um, then can I then ask Karen to be brought out of the spotlight, and we bring in Mark, please. There we go. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to the team at Sport NI. If it was nearly all covered by the time Karen spoke, it, 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 it is even more so now. I'm just trying to go through my notes that I haven't uh, scribbled out. First and foremost, uh, to thank yourselves for coming along this morning and the team at Sport NI uh, for uh, your Trojan efforts in terms of not just the, the, this fund, but, but the other funds that you have been administering to help uh, our sporting organisations. Karen's outlined there pretty well the, the value of sport, and that's very much recognised by us as a committee. You'll be well aware that we were making the case for a fund like this long before it, it, it was even announced, and we recognise the, the benefits, not even the benefits, but the, the, the lifeline that this has provided to, to many grassroots clubs and indeed organisations, and that's vitally important, not just now, but to give them and give us as a, as a region a springboard uh, for, for getting out of this unprecedented mess. And while lessons are there to, to be there, and hopefully we're never in a situation that they need to be applied. 
Well, there's a very broad spectrum of sports and, 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 and a broad spectrum of clubs and, and capacities within those uh, sports, but there's also a, a broad spectrum of need. We often hear the minister talking about objective need, and it, it, it's hard sort of to equate that with a scheme that doesn't take things such as, as reserves and the account. You look at profit and loss, sheets as, a, as opposed to, to uh, balance sheets and, and I've heard John's explanation uh, as to why that was done. It's not a decision that was taken lightly but in terms of the initial media coverage and outrage in, in, in some quarters when this was announced, I think it's fair to say it wasn't uh, just from within the sporting uh, sector. I think there's a wider societal issue there when we see the difficulty that many businesses and, and, and thousands of individuals have had as a result of the pandemic and when they did hear and see some of the figures that have been awarded through this fund I think it's it's natural enough that there'd be some uh, type of backlash. Catherine I think mentioned their challenges around data and resourcing I wonder if you could maybe elaborate on that. I think that was within your own organisation and the difficulties that you had uh, de dealing with all this uh, mountain of work that you have had to, to deal with. Also, in terms of the audit office, I know you submitted something to them on the 24th of February. W what exactly was that, if you, if you could just clarify that for me? And, and, and has there been any feedback from them to date on that? Or, or, or were there any eyebrows? Questions raised at any stage then? Uh, okay, Mark, your your first question around um, the data and resourcing. I think, as as everyone will appreciate, everyone in in every department, every public body, every voluntary organisation, you know, we've all been under increasing pressure over the past year, and um, dealing with the impact of the pandemic, alongside our our business as usual work. Though I think sometimes we struggle to remember what business as usual work was. So alongside handling the, the restrictions and dealing with the return to sport and then the cessation of sport um, and the ongoing regulations around that, we were also trying to set up, establish and manage these schemes. So the re resourcing implications were clear across the piece and you know we did have to prioritise and we did have to work very closely together to work out how, do you, how best to address those issues. So really that's what I was alluding to there. In terms of the CNAG, um, it was the business case that was provided to the NIAO um, and we haven't had any feedback yet. And my understanding is it was part of a routine piece of work in looking at COVID schemes um, and business cases were collected as regards the number of schemes at that time. Okay, uh, th thanks Catherine. It, just from what I'm picking up today, it, it seems almost that this fund was seen almost like a, an income replacement type type thing as opposed to merely covering the cost of ongoing costs and and, and expenditure and john there had mentioned you know some of these organizations would have uh, employees out in furlough and stuff like that but, but had that been calculated or, or included whenever computing the, the final amounts that organizations would get and, and Mark, no, I mean, it absolutely wasn't an income replacement scheme. It was on, in terms of evidence net losses. Um, so it will have taken into account the income and the expenditure of the organisations. So you, you're quite right. Many will have had significantly reduced income, but correspondingly, many will have had significantly reduced expenditure. And it was that net position we were considering. Yeah, and, and uh, Sinead there had mentioned from some quarters an almost demonisation of some sports and certainly we don't want that at all or anything that maybe turns one sport against another or pits them against each other. I think all sports are equally valuable and all sports should feel therefore equally valued. It seems to me that part of the issue here in terms of the, the, the big winners as, as the media describe them, uh, the golf clubs who got huge amounts of money here. We recognise the, the value of golf, not just as a sport, and I know many people who've been counting down the days till today when, when they can get back out on the course, but also to to Northern Ireland as a tourism de destination. 
in terms of uh, the, the awards to those clubs coming from, from this fund, it's almost like some of that might have been better fallen with the Department for Economy, but because of the, the, the economic value uh, of them, as opposed to a, a purely sports-based fund. And I suppose the Sports Sustainability Fund was set up for all clubs that were affiliated to an eligible sports governing body. So the golf, the golf clubs fell within that remit. And, you know, as you said, in terms of sustaining golf, you know, the clubs were subject to the same criteria that all other sports had to comply with. And John, anything you want to add in terms of the, the golf? Uh, I'm going to say, well, not specifically in terms of golf. My, Sport A and I, uh, you know, we, we, we exist as a, we're a sports development organisation. We exist to, you know, to support sport. And, you know, and, and that's what we do. You know, if, uh, you know cer certainly we, we've advocated uh, for, you know, as much support for sport as possible the whole way through the pandemic, you know, going right back to some of the, you know, our earliest engagements, you know, back in, in, in April after we were, when we were first found ourselves in lockdown. Uh, we certainly we have tried to, you know, be that strong, consistent voice for sport, along with the governing bodies themselves, uh, to make sure that support was there. And I think, you know, if we, you know, if if we hadn't been doing that, you know, governing bodies and sport would rightly have been, you know, been reflecting that back to us. So I think it, it it's our it is our role to advocate for sport and to make sure that the value of sport is is seen and recognised by as many people as possible. Yeah, and you do do that well. Well, this is an on precedent and has been a non-precedented situation. It's not exactly a non-paralleled one. You know, that this is happening the world over. Did you guys look at uh, schemes in other jurisdictions and how they were being uh, rolled out or, or managed? And, and, and how would this scheme compare? Mark, um, what I would say, Mark, is that um, we work very closely with um, the um, five uh, as part of the five UK sports councils and we work very closely with Sport Ireland and we continue to look across um, other um, similar jurisdictions, Denmark, New Zealand, for example, um, in terms of um, global best practice um, in our sport development work. But what we were very clear about and made a very clear instruction from the minister um, and our D4C colleagues was um, to meet the needs in Northern Ireland. So we actually had clear evidence of what was needed on the ground here. And we have quite... Um, we have a very different, for example, even from um, England, we have a very, very different um, sports um, infrastructure. It's not as mature um, as some of the much more professional um, sporting um, governing bodies across the water. So it's very hard to compare apples and pears. But what we did do is, uh, and we continue to monitor and talk to our colleagues um, across the, these islands, um, but we designed a scheme on the, the basis of the evidence that was presented to us from the sector in, in Northern Ireland. And uh, I suppose, finally, once you guys had done all your work, and the, 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 there was lots of it, and, and put this back up to the department and the minister, was there any pushback or comeback at, the, at that point from the department? Any queries raised about, about the, the payments being recommended? or the size of them in some instances? What, what I would say, Mark, is that, as Kathleen has said and Tony has said um, earlier, we've worked hand in glove um, with the department and the sector. I mean, the co-design was from the very outset and we challenged each other. Of course, we had challenged from the department all the way through. That's the role of the department. And it actually gave us that additional assurance um, by being challenged, um, just as you're challenging us today, and quite rightly so. It gives us the added um, assurance that we've got things right. Um, and they were right from where we sat at the time. We were sitting in the middle of a really, really volatile situation and genuine concern of ours. Um, on the evidence we were receiving that the sports sector was definitely in difficulty. Um, so, yes, absolutely ongoing challenge um, and support um, in appropriate measure. And were there any per particular queries or, or th that they raised? Did you know like about any of the amounts? Did they say, how did that come about? And, and you had to then provide them evidence of the work that you guys had done to come to the conclusions that you had? 
apologies, Mark. Now I understand. Um, now I understand what you're um, asking. Um, no, because the department had um, had been through. The department had actually been through the um, the bit. They developed the business case. We um, developed the design proposals. We had all been through that and worked together on it. So the department would have known um, the source and the rationale for the um, funding that was being provided to individual um, clubs and individual governing bodies. Okay, no, no that's great. And, and the other but and I know it's, it's been brilliant, so many clubs have, have benefited from this and so many organisations and, and, and the value that that will bring, not just to them, but to, to their communities. And this place as a whole, there are a large number of clubs still, however, plenty across the number of sporting codes who've fallen through uh, the, the cracks. You sp spoke there something did about the ongoing capacity building and stuff that has to be done, I remember, in, in a previous life and the network that you've done on financial capability. So <laughs> hopefully uh, you can bring that experience and, and the expertise to those clubs uh, r r right across the north to, to, to help them build uh, capacity and, and, and go from strength to strength doing the, the great stuff that, that, that they have been doing. Are you guys concerned, it, it, it's almost an aside f f from this, about, uh, I suppose, the precarious position of uh, of clubs out there still, you know, particularly those who weren't able to, to avail of this? I know sometimes there are clubs there that might have fractious enough relationships with go governing bodies and, and, and things like that. But uh, you, you spoke of potential future efforts to assist but how many clubs i'd say or, or how big a problem is it do you think or just how precarious is the situation for how many clubs out there yeah and it's it's very hard uh, mark given the diversity of our sector it's very hard for me to say that there are x amount of clubs in difficulty but we have continued to stay close to the governing bodies and the leadership in the governing bodies of sport and i have heard repeatedly over the past number of weeks um, from governing bodies um, that um, the sports sector there would have absolutely been closures if we hadn't provided the funding but that um, the need continues and I think you're absolutely spot on Mark in terms of talking about the precarious nature of this <laughs> defiant pandemic because we've had to go into lockdown these restrictions go back into lockdown effectively so um, we know that the sports sector in Northern Ireland is, is quite a fragile ecosystem we have some really strong governing bodies of sport and we have some um, governing bodies themselves who need a lot of support and that's been a huge learning for us as well, the strong connectivity between some of our governing bodies um, and their clubs and that relationship, as you said. And um, Build Back Better, our, our new um, uh, lottery programme, is aimed at actually lifting the lessons learned from the, the sustainability and the, the crisis funding that we've provided and actually bring that into a more dynamic and um, thriving sector. And that's also a key focus of our draft corporate plan which we we still have to have approval from the department on but that capability and adding value piece is absolutely critical going forward okay and, and i suppose we, we we look forward to as a committee assisting you with that uh thank you very important piece of work but thank you okay thank you mark um i have one final uh, member want to ask question that's robin uh thank you chair and uh can I welcome Antoinette, Catherine, John and Tony uh, to, to the meeting. I have to say, Chair, Mr Durkin opened his remarks by saying all the questions had already been asked and he struggled manfully onwards to find uh, <laughs> additional questions uh, to, uh, and, and, and relevant questions. So well done to, to him. Uh, I, on, I only have a few short questions, Chair, but could I, like others, uh, pay tribute to all who are involved in, in sports, uh, sporting activity in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and indeed, also, I believe that uh, in as we recover from the COVID-19 uh, pandem pandemic, the physical health and perhaps more importantly, the mental health um, uh, is going to be very important and sport can play a very positive role in, in that. 
Uh, and indeed, as was mentioned by one other member, the economic potential of sport uh, in, in what it brings to, to Northern Ireland uh, 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 for the future of our tourism as well. It, it, it indeed ha does. Uh, the cohesiveness of sport contributes, uh, I think, very successfully to uh, the building of friendships, uh, much respect uh, amongst uh, the athletes in sporting, uh, and indeed fraternity and the healthy rivalry that, that uh, is, is developed. In. Uh, and we should see uh, it not as a cost, uh, but indeed as an investment and an investment in society uh, as, a, as a whole. I've only got a few short questions. Um, can I maybe just try to understand, now that the money has been allocated to the sporting bodies, what is the process of the sporting bodies or in association with Sport NI getting the money out to the individual clubs? What, what is that process? Thank you. Uh, Robin, part of the, the we've mentioned the specific terms and conditions uh, that went out with the letter of offer. So if we if we, if we take uh, any of the governing bodies, you know that where there are club elements and you know whether it's cricket, hockey, swimming, so on and so forth, uh, that the, their letter of offer will have contained a, an itemised breakdown of the amounts of money. That we expect to see paid out to the main clubs within the within the application that had evidence net losses. Uh, part of our due diligence checks and part of our post award vouching will be checking with the governing body that the money that has been transferred over to the governing body account then moves swiftly from the governing body account out to the club account, and that, so that will be part of the, the the due diligence. And I have no doubt. But again, that's part of the, the the principles of transparency. That's one of the reasons why we published the amounts. Uh, on the website and also required as part of the terms and conditions that governing bodies would publicise the amounts that had been awarded to them. Uh, so that there would be complete transparency because the one thing that we know uh, about all of our sports clubs is that if there's money due to them, uh, they will certainly uh, you know, be chasing up on that if it doesn't reach their accounts as quickly as possible. I'm not aware of any uh, issues in that respect at this point in time. Oh, that, that's, that's, that's excellent. Then can, can I maybe just ask you a question in terms of when the club, when the sporting bodies made the application for the level of support that they thought uh, they were entitled to, or well, they, that, that, that they needed, how, how was it that in two cases, one body received about 80% more than they applied and another body received uh, more than 100% more than they applied for? What was the case for that? Uh, 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 you know, I, I, I take that. That's, uh, I, uh, Robin, again, it's down to uh, the way in which the application form had been completed. Uh, I, I think, and you, you've quite rightly picked up on uh, the, I suppose, the, trans the, the effect of the transparency that uh, we didn't simply get uh, applications in from sports and, and cut and paste those, you know, the, a final figure across into a recommended amount. You know, uh, our, we've, we've had a, you know, a robust uh, verification and vouching exercise that's been undertaken by our own team and also being supported by Ernst & Young uh, through the process where we, you know, we examined the figures and the information that was provided by all applicants, uh, by governing bodies, uh, the 100% vouching of all the governing bodies, uh, and in many cases, 100% vouching of, uh, of club awards in many of those sports as well. And for we identified errors within their, their application, we were able to go back and correct those errors. And that's for uh, you know that's one of the places where we've had we've had queries of people said you know oh, wh why is the amount different from that which was requested? Now that difference generally will have been a difference down uh, where something has been included within the account within the application that shouldn't have been included and we have picked that up there our, uh, our vouching exercises but equally there have been cases where uh, clubs had applied uh, for an amount of money and hadn't uh, hadn't included all of the eligible costs from within their prior year accounts and we've been able to go back to them and say actually uh, what you what you're able to apply for here is 
you know, as you say, a, an increased amount of, of funding. And I suppose that, that brings us back to uh, something that, that Antoinette and Catherine have both touched on. It's around capability within the sector. And that's where, you know, as part of our, you know, support and support, uh, build back better from this, that we want to build capability uh, within sports and within governing bodies in terms of uh, financial management, in terms of those governance skills, uh, as well as looking to, you know, in, in the longer term also, increase capacity amongst the workforce, uh, volunteer staff, et cetera, within sports. Okay, that's, that, that's grand. And, and just finally then, in terms of the media coverage, uh, where it has indicated that the Northern Ireland Audit Office may take an interest in this uh, scheme. Uh, I presume you would welcome that interest uh, for, for an audit to take place. Uh, absolutely, Robin. Um, I, I think uh, it would be disingenuous if anybody said they enjoyed being audited, but it is, of course, a welcome process, and um, we look forward to, to picking up any lessons we can take forward from that. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank okay, you. thanks, Robin. Um, Andy, you wanted to come in? Yeah, sure. Thanks very much. And um, like others, most of the points have indeed been covered now. So I have two points only. Um, can I start by thanking Catherine, John, Antoinette and Tony for coming to the committee today. It's very much welcome. And indeed, their sterling work in delivering the Sports Sustainability Fund under such uh, challenging circumstances. Indeed, I know from many clubs that have been in contact with me, it's very much welcomed uh, in the wider fabric of delivering sport um, across our communities. Yeah. We're, we're obviously very much aware of one particular concern that's been raised, and I know Sinead touched on it in, in regard to the application process, and, and there's no concerns, but are there any other concerns that the department, uh, our sport and I, have been made aware of at this stage? And just throw in my second question as well at this stage, it's also been indicated that there may be uh, a number of um, clubs who have articulated to Sport NI that they weren't perhaps afforded an opportunity to apply to the fund for whatever reason. Is that the case? And if so, how many clubs um, have indicated that to be the case? Antoinette, do you want to cover um, the applications to Sport NI or John maybe? I'm happy to pick up and at, at the at the start of the the program we've made it very clear that in terms of eligibility applications were accepted from recognized uh, governing bodies of sport uh, there were a number of clubs that that uh, mistakenly or you know incorrectly submitted applications to us uh, we, we took uh, we took we took each of those under consideration and tried to make a reasonable adjustment for that uh, liaised with the governing body and 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 uh, there were five of those applications came in directly to us. Uh, four of those, uh, they were incorporated then within the governing body application. I mean, a number of those applications actually, because the information had been submitted to us before the closing date, it was actually also incorporated within the initial governing body application. Subsequent to the closing date, uh, we've been, aware, been made aware that there were, I have to say, it's, it's a handful of clubs uh, out of the, the, the two and a half thousand plus clubs that are out there in Northern Ireland that have contacted us to say they weren't aware of the opportunity or they missed the opportunity. And, you know, in, in many cases, you know, very, very genuine reasons. I have to say, and a lot of those sometimes very genuine reasons that have also been sort of wound up with COVID-19 and the, 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 the human impact of, of, of COVID with, on, on individuals within clubs. Uh, that's part of the discussions that, you know, we, we identify that there continues to be need within the sports sector. And, and I've said already, and we've all said already that, you know, we're continuing to advocate on behalf of the sports sector and sports clubs for, you know, any additional uh, support that we may be, may be able to bring to bear in, in, in the future. Please. Oh, oh, well, as, when I say a handful, I'm, Larry, it's, I'm, I'm aware of uh, six clubs. Uh, so, sorry, it's not quite, it's more than a handful. Uh, it's, um, but I'm, I'm aware of six clubs that, you know, that, that uh, had been in touch with us to say that, you know, they would like to have been able to apply, but they missed the opportunity. Uh, so that's, it's six is, is the figure that I have in my head. Uh, across, uh, you know, a couple of sports. I'm not saying there there may well be others out there that may not have contacted us. So, um, you know, I know governing bodies continue to get inquiries directly uh, from clubs 
Uh, so governing bodies, uh, you know, uh, m may have longer uh, lists or whatever. But then governing bodies are also saying to us, you know, this need continues to be there and is likely to be there. And uh, well, it, we're now in 2021, 22. Uh, so governing bodies are reflecting those needs or that ongoing need on behalf of their membership and their clubs. And um, Alan or Andy, if it's okay, um, Chair, if, if I may just um, say that we are, as we said earlier, continuing to monitor that need. We're, we're um, continuing to, to stay in touch with the governing bodies of sport, um, obviously working very closely with the department. But if any of you or any other of our political representatives um, know of any clubs who have either fallen through the funding um, gaps or who have not had an opportunity for whatever reason to apply, please, please get in touch with us. We'd only be um, too happy to include um, that information as we provide continued advice to the Minister on that need. Okay, Andy. Yeah, just, just uh, Chair, in relation to any other concerns, in addition to that one particular concern that's been raised that the Department's aware of? Uh, no. I mean, there's continuing correspondence, but... Um, it's more around queries in relation to the media coverage, but if there's anything that comes forward, we will, of course, keep you informed. I think, Andy, we, we are looking into issues around other schemes and access. Some clubs opted to apply to LRSS, and there's a, a group looking at data matching across the different COVID schemes, and that may um, result in some clubs um, citing reasons why they weren't coming to SSF because they've gone to the local restriction scheme. They may not have been tied to the local restriction scheme. So there's that element that we are aware of and we're working through that. Okay, thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Andy. Um, I just, was, uh, just a couple of points before we wrap up. Um, just on that issue then, to follow on from Andy there, where you'd mentioned earlier about the 70 clubs and then this other, the, the six clubs, whatever the amount is, I know the committee will have forwarded all of their correspondence onto yourselves um, over the last sort of three months. We have had uh, you know numerous correspondence um, from various clubs um, that because of the LRSS uh, issue um, that didn't, they, they actually felt they didn't need to apply for the Sports Sustainability Fund because they understood that that would be double funding and that they did it in all honesty and that they've, you know, they felt the pain because of that. But there are other clubs out there and we, we have heard from them as well. I've certainly heard from one um, that had said we didn't even know about this scheme. And maybe it was the age demographic of the of the people that played that sport. Maybe it was, as you say, because of COVID, people aren't meeting. They're not holding. They're not meeting up in their clubhouse. They're not talking about the various things that are out there. And um, and that, that they're quite genuine cases um, where that happened. Which again is uh, it's not your fault, and it's not the fault of Sport NI. But there is a little bit of blame needs to lie with some of those governing bodies and getting their message out there. Um, as I said earlier, some did extremely well, and more, more part of them, um, and, and others did really quite badly at, at encouraging their members to apply. So I think there's a little bit of work, and I think that's good that you've said there about the resilience and building that resilience. I think that is a positive that has come to, certainly there's been many positives have come out of this. Um, I also mm. just want to ask a quick question about the clubs with less than three years. Now I, I, under, I absolutely understand and get it. Um, that you would want two full years audited accounts um, in order to look at the difference between um, last year's accounts and the previous years. Um, I know we did get contact as well by some clubs that were, were actually didn't have the full three years. Do you have a number on that of clubs that, that couldn't apply because they, they weren't operational for their, uh, that length of time? Uh, sure. I can come on that. I can't give you a figure as to the number that didn't apply. So we don't know how many didn't apply. We you know we can give you the figures as to the numbers that, that did apply. But we do know from feedback uh, from the governing bodies that there, there were some clubs, and you know, and every sport has uh, has churn in their in their clubs on an annual basis. Uh, that uh, you know, it's it's not about it wasn't about having all of the accounts. I think was the phrase used. It was about having three years worth of accounts. But uh, you know, whether they're all of the accounts or whether they are three years worth of accounts, there will um, we're aware that some clubs have maybe only come into existence in the last twelve, eight, you know, twelve, eighteen months, uh, twenty-four months. So may not have had uh, the, the three years to be able to apply 
and evidence that need for sustainability fund. But we have, uh, and we've you know, referred to it a couple of times, is that, you know, the, the sports hardship fund was there as another port of call and another port of entry for lots of the lots of other clubs, uh, 911 uh, unique clubs that we've been able to support through sports hardship fund. Uh, and you know we're we're already looking at, at trying to you know crunch numbers and analyze and see what insights we can get you know for going forward from the sports sustainability fund. Uh, because it, it's very it's very easy for us to say the total amount of money that uh, that's been issued to the sector and the total number of clubs, but actually there's a there's almost a, a segmentation that can be done, an analysis that can be done as to uh, you know link, looking at the, the the size of those clubs and there's research that we had done la this time last year into the the club sector to give us a, a better understanding as to you know what annual turnover will be within clubs, what membership looks like, how that varies across Northern Ireland. Uh, how that varies by sport. So I think there's a lot more insight uh, that we that we want to get in terms of what the sports sector looks like as we go forward. But those clubs that that that, that are relatively new on the scene, there has been support available for them. Uh, say the sports hardship fund and COVID safe sports packs are two that immediately spring to mind in terms of of uh, cash and 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 benefits and kinds uh, support and practical support. And that uh, obviously sits alongside. Uh, the other uh, supports around uh, information and advice and guidance uh, on how to, make, you know, for sports to, to be able to come back. But I, I suspect your, your question is about the the cash uh, aspect of it as well, the, the finance. No, and that's fair enough. And I mean, I do understand, and we know the whole way through COVID, no matter what department has rolled out money, there ha I mean, their evidence is required, and I absolutely agree with that. Um, that you have to show evidence of, of losses. And for some that are, 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 are not going very long time, that would have been very, very difficult to do. Mm. Albeit we do know they still have rent to pay and various other overheads and you know bills that are coming in. Just on the safe sports pack, um, I, I was speaking to one of my, my local um, bowling <coughs> clubs recently and they had just received their delivery and were completely uh, bowled over, well, to, to country is. Um, <laughs> just the amount, the amount of stuff that they have received and just cannot wait to have their doors open again to be able to and I suppose with a lot of our sports clubs as well whenever we do see those relaxations come in uh, around hospitality our, our, our sports clubs that have hospitality venues within them are in the perfect position because of the open space that they have as well um, to be able to uh, attract um, business and be able to operate so I mean I, I can't wait I certainly can't wait to be able to go uh, and the avail of all of those services within uh, certainly my local clubs around where I live um, and I know that this that this funding will have gone some way um, to help in that look I, I, I'm happy enough if uh, members are happy enough to leave it there I just would want to just to continue our discussions around the those that are that those that have been um, left out you know that that sort of that group of 70 plus um, of people that have found themselves either falling between um, the, the schemes are, are, are actually in, you know, just didn't know about it. Um, mm -hmm. So if we can continue those discussions on, I would be happy, very happy with that, um, because it's something the committee has been very much involved with for a few months now. Um, so I'm, I'm okay there. Sinead, I see your hand up. Do you want back in again? Yes, sure. Um, thanks, thanks for coming back to me there. It's just, I'm just wondering there. Um, it may have been provided already, but I, I I don't seem to be able to find it. But if the um if the officials could provide maybe a, a breakdown or a figure um from the twenty five million, if they have it just um on the level of funding that went to grassroots sports, um if they were able to provide that, I think that'd be very helpful, very useful. No, thank you for that, Sinead. And suppose to add on to Sinead's, I know one of the, the, the aims and objectives was to look at women in sport and disability sport. So it might be good to get those, if, if you can, break it down um, into those, uh, you know, some of that information as well. Um, I, I know we can't make, we couldn't force people to apply to this scheme. You know, it was up to, the, it was up to those various clubs to apply. Um, but it would be interesting to know also, I think, if we can add that on to that, if, if, um, if Sinead's happy with that as well, committee are happy with that, because um, mm -hmm. it's something that the committee has taken an interest in as well, um, to do with those uh, those those sports as well. Um, members, any other questions they want? Are we happy enough to, to call it, call time on this now? Yep, yeah, okay. And as I say, look, I really would love you to come back and to further those discussions around the ones that didn't get. Um, if we can do that uh, at some stage in the future. So thank you to all of you for your, your time today.
Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Okay, members. Um, I, but any other then follow up from that? I know that's certainly a follow up I want to do, and I know the committee will be of the same opinion around all of those clubs that have missed out through no fault of their own. Um, and and certainly I'm very encouraged by what we heard today around those issues that the that the department and sport and I are certainly actively looking at that. Um, and you know if we can help in any way and support the minister in any further calls for further bids for money. Um, I, 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 I would be, I'd be very happy to do that. Um, the committee would agree with that, I assume, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know, Kelly, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I was just going to say that capacity building is something that we need to consider. Um, I appreciate that during COVID, on, <coughs> excuse me, online and... Um, you know, letting people know by social media was certainly a way for the majority of people to access information. However, um, some of our sports clubs, as we know, um, uh, not to be disingenuous with bowling clubs, but they tend to be people of a certain age who maybe are not as, <clears throat> excuse me, um, not as used to dealing with the internet or using emails even. Um, I think there is something there about capacity building for those groups to ensure that they don't miss out on opportunities because they're not used to using um, the internet or applying for funds and so on. I'm very heartened to hear that Sport and I have a plan in place for that. But if they promote it via social media, it again compounds the issue that there still will be groups left out. So I'd be quite keen to um, maybe even write to the department um, to ask them how they're engaging with the Department of Economy with regards to Project Stratum and I can't think of the name of the other one. It's the, the rural areas that were the, the secondary programme for digital outreach because there's no point in wonderful programmes coming forward if people can't find out about them or don't have the capacity to apply for them online. Okay, no, thank you. That's a good point as well, Kelly. I, I'm going, can I ask Fra to come in? Fra, I am very sorry. Yeah. I didn't, your hand, I don't know, for whatever reason, I just saw a wee message there from you saying that you wanted to come right. in. So can I apologise for not bringing no. you in, Fra? Oh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I think it was just my uh, machine here was, in terms of uh, volume, was going up and down. And uh, so it's probably my fault. Uh, and I, but uh, I have to say it was uh, a, quite a good meeting, uh, quite a good exercise in terms of, uh, drawn out uh, a, a, a lot of difficulties that uh, the department, but I think the, the, the point to make, and I think uh, Sinead made it right at the start of the, uh, start of this, and 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 that the the very fact that we're sitting here for a whole morning discussing this uh, in many ways uh, was media led, and that has run all week that something had went wrong, and uh, that uh, trying to apportion blame where no blame existed. And I think the important thing that we need to do, especially out of the question and answer time, is to uh, just commend and congratulate uh, the, 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 the Department, uh, Sport NI, and the Minister. Uh, because remember, we're in very, very difficult times, and I have no doubt that when we come out of this, it will concentrate and focus our minds on how we maybe do things a little bit different, but we should we should be led uh, by what uh, we 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 obviously believe ourselves. And it was just uh, that's that's a point that I wanted to make is that uh, that we let let the minister know, we let the department know, and we let uh, sports and I uh, know that we have every confidence in the ability and their ability in the way this has been handled from the start. Fra and I, I think the witness session was very, very beneficial this morning. Albeit it did eat in time into our, our committee deliberations. You're absolutely right. Um, I think that this committee, uh, the way we have worked, and it always is on an evidence base, and we have heard the evidence. And I, I mean, I, I'd, I'd said it right from the beginning that sports clubs had done nothing wrong here. They, they had applied for a scheme that was open. We just wanted to know the, the finer details around that. We found them out. Um, I, I can say that I'm, I'm satisfied with what I've heard today. Um, so I am. I, I, I commend them on getting the money out so quickly. That has been fantastic. 
um, because we know that for many of those sports clubs, we've heard from them for months now, just uh, the desperation that they have been in. Um, so I, I'm glad that we, we went ahead with the meeting today and um, got some of the answers that we, that we, we wanted to ask. Um, and, and it is, it's always very difficult whenever something is um, being uh, led and put across the media. And uh, I mean, I did hear at one stage that the committee were even being blamed um, for for part of this, and that's why I thought it was essential that the committee. Need, I mean, our role is to hear evidence, and we can only go on evidence and nothing else. Um, we can't we can't make it up as we go along. It's a, it's an evidence based committee, and we're here to support the minister as well, um, and support all of those all of those people that the department represent. So. Um, I, I'm glad that we did do that, and as I say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with a lot of the responses that I've heard today. Um, members, any further comments they want to make? Because we're going, to, I'm going to bring the meeting just to a, a short um, pit stop for for ten minutes, if members are in agreement, and, and then, well, even five minutes. Are members happy enough that we do that now? Yeah. yeah? Okay, members. So yeah. can I just then can we resume back at half eleven then? Okay. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This okay, we're back up and running again, and I've just noticed my screen's down. So, Janice, can you get my screen back up again? <laughs> Sorry. Um, we're going to move then on to agenda item six, which is out, yeah. our committee deliberations on the clauses of the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Um, members will continue today with our deliberations on the bill, and then we, again we'll have a closed session later. Um, with Claire from the Bill Office to further discuss any decisions to any of our clauses. Um, can I then, I can, oh, there we go, I've got my screen. I have all of the members in the screen, that screen can it, can broadcasting, can we have all of the members brought into the spotlight and also um, Carol and Liam brought into the spotlight as well, please? There we are. I need Sinead in just. There we are, that's everybody in. Okay, is that everyone in? Yes, it is, isn't it? Let me just check. Yep, it is. It is. Look, thank you. Okay, members, um, then we'll move on. And welcome, very welcome, Carl and Liam, to the meeting today again. Good to see you. Um, so then can I firstly draw attention to page 83, where we've been provided with a recent press release from NISRA in relation to alcohol-specific alcohol mortality in Northern Ireland. Um, NISRA has highlighted that the alcohol-specific mortality rate in Northern Ireland for persons aged 15 to 74 years has increased by almost 50% between 2001 and 2019. And between 2001 and 2019, male mortality rates for alcohol-specific deaths have been approximately two times higher than female rates, but mortality rates for females have risen more sharply than males over that time, and both where both were alcohol is underlying cause of death and where alcohol is the contributory cause. Um, can I just ask members at this stage then, any comments that, or are they content to note that? Content, okay. Can I then uh, go to further correspondence at page 84 of your packs? And that's from the Society of Independent Brewers Association, which details the social and economic impacts of tap rooms in GB and addresses some of the department's concerns raised at last week's meeting in terms of sustainability of, uh, or sorry, suitability of premises, health and safety, and that tap rooms could be entered into by large scale producers and not confined to smaller local producers. Uh, members, there's always also a table paper from the Independent Craft Brewers of Ireland on the operation of equivalent licensing legislation in the Republic of Ireland, which allows for tap rooms. And then also in addition, at page 92, you've been provided with several letters of concern from publicans in relation to tap rooms. And I know certainly myself to my own office, I've, I've received about 12 um, separate emails from publicans. So members, can I propose that we note all of this correspondence at this stage and consider it in our closed session um, when we uh, deliberate again on clause 8? Are members happy enough with that? Yeah, okay. 
All right then, members, after the meeting of the 25th of March, March, we wrote to the department with queries on several clauses. The minister's response, response is not yet with us, but Liam and Carol can update us on a number of issues. So I propose that we be useful to run through the queries from last week's meeting to remind us um, where we are on certain clauses and deal with that if we can today. Um, we will plan then to finalise deliberation at our first meeting after the Easter recess, so that will be the 15th of April, and by that stage we will have had all of the Minister's responses. So we'll start then at Clause 2. So members, last week we discussed the issue of late licences on Sundays. We agreed that the Minister should now take forward um, an amendment to bring the legislation relating to Article 44 permitted hours um, on Sundays into line with permitted hours for other late nights guaranteed for premises. Um, we're waiting on the Minister's response on that one. I don't know, Liam and Carl, if you feel you need to jump in at any time and, or if you know if it can clarify anything, happy enough with that as well. Um, so we haven't heard anything back on that. I don't know if Carl, Carl or Liam want to say anything on that. No. No, okay. Sorry. Dead on. That's grand. Then, members, clause seven. Um, we have a number of issues to consider around Drumbo Park. Um, Drumbo Park had requested that places of public entertainment and outdoor stadiums be included in Article 45 of the licensing order. Um, currently, it relies on places of public entertainment licensed to sell alcoholic drink to members of the public. But I can confirm that the licensing designation of outdoor stadia regulations Northern Ireland um, was made by the department on the 25th of March 2021, and we will be considering that at our meeting on the 15th of April. Uh, and that's a statutory rule that, uh, that the department has designed um, the some some the some Dumbo Trumbo Park Stadium as a stadium of importance to the whole of Northern Ireland, and in doing so, it allowed Jumbo Park Stadium to apply to the courts for a liquor licence. Um, members, last week the committee discussed further the issue of Drumbo Park and we are of the understanding that Clause 7 will permit the sale of alcohol there on a Sunday. However, the committee requested clarification if the sale um, was uh, contingent to, on, on race meetings taking place. Um, Liam or Carol, um, can you update us on that last point that was made? It was something that we raised in our closed group. Um, that we that the, the Sunday opening it, must there be a race meet on for that to happen? Yes, Chair, sure, I'll take that one. So I suppose starting with the current position, um, there are only two types of categories of premises where the sale of alcohol isn't ancillary, and that's your pubs and off licences. Um, so yes, Clause Seven, whenever it does allow for Sunday opening, it would be contingent on a race meeting taking place. Um, it would also be 30 minutes either side of that entertainment, of that race meeting, um, and that would be within a time period of half 12 to 10. Um, now, again, currently, we believe that Drumbo Park in particular, as a place of public entertainment, has a restaurant. So. There, are, there, there would be an opportunity for them to go to a court at the minute and obtain a restaurant license. As part of a restaurant license then, they could obtain an Article 44, which is where they could seek late opening habitually. So that's their every Friday and Saturday night. So that option is available to them now. Um, in terms of the, the designation, yes, that designation went through on the 25th. Um, Drumbo Park are aware of that. Um, that would allow them then to apply for that category of license to begin with and then apply for um, an Article 47 on occasions then, but that would be for functions rather than the habitual nature that the, the 44 would allow as a restaurant license. Um, I think there was a question at some stage about an Article 45. Um, Article 45s are very specific um, just to those small pubs. It's not ancillary to anything taking place because those small pubs don't have capacity to do that. They're not structurally adapted to do that. Um, so I think I've covered everything there. Is that, does that? Yeah, that does answer. Um, so even if there's not then a race meet on on a Sunday, they could apply then through the restaurant license. Is that what you're saying? Yes, the restaurant licence would be for the um, sale of alcohol and ancillary to the provision of food, yes. Okay, no, that, that's, 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 that's answered that for me. Members, any, any question they want to ask there of um, Carol or Liam? No? Kelly, your hand's up. I don't know if you want to ask a question or whether it's just been left up from earlier. Must be up from earlier, sorry, okay. Chair. That's grand, okay. So, members, happy enough with the responses there around Drumbo from the department? Yeah. yeah? 
Okay. Sure. sure. Go ahead. Go ahead, Fra. Well, I, I kick it on the back of that. We're we're not making any decision on that now. Uh, that 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 uh, the that, 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 the the session, especially from the 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 department, is more for information. That they allow us to make a decision uh, uh, later on. Yep. Spot on. Uh, absolutely. Um, we'll go into closed session after with, and the department will leave us and then we'll make our decisions then. Okay, thank you. Thank you. No bother. Okay, members, well, we move on then to Clause 8. Um, members, we gave considerable time um, on Clause 8 in closed session last week. However, we did not yet come up with an agreed position. Um, we will return to this again in closed session. But, members, before we move on to Clause 9, I'd like to highlight that at the meeting on the 11th of March, we discussed Clause 18, which covers the conditions around occasional licences. Um, we discussed the possibility of the inclusion of a provision for an organisation or local council to apply for an occasional licence in order to hold a festival or event, the likes of the Christmas markets and things like that. Um, we also noted that using occasional licences is how local producers currently run tap rooms from time to time. It has been brought to the, our attention that we haven't yet made any firm decision around Clause 18. So could I ask that we discuss it now while we have the officials with it, so we can return to it then in our closed session. Um, so, uh, Carol, uh, Carol, could you just remind members of the current process regarding the use of uh, occasion licences and the potential impact of Clause 18? Yes, Chair. So currently for if you look at local tap or local producers then if they're looking to run a tap room they would need to approach um a pub a restaurant or a hotel and the, the those three categories of premises then the license holders can go to the court and apply for an occasional license um as part of that application they need to notify the local police and the local council sorry just a double check that um they need to, the, to notify the local police and the local council um the police can then go, they can object at that hearing, um, but it's only where there has been undue inconvenience caused at a previous at a previous function at that particular place. Um, so in terms of the, the application of that, I know that was raised during some of your evidence sessions, in terms of the application for that, that's an issue for the judiciary in terms of how they apply. You know, the, the, the law specifies the conditions under which the license can be, the occasional license can be granted. Um, linking it in with Clause 18 then, um, Clause 18 is where um, an amendment would be made to the bill that would allow conditions to be placed in advance on an occasional license. Um, the reason for that is, that, as I say, under the current system, an occasional license is granted to a place that isn't licensed. So it could be it could be any place, um, you know, it's used for concerts and, and things like that. So if there was an event taking place um, and there was any issues arising from it, the, the police could then ask for conditions to be placed on a license currently if that event was to take place at the same place. So there are ways around that where the event could just be moved. So the police have asked for um, an opportunity to be able to place conditions on it in advance of the of, of, of the license actually being granted. My understanding is that it's more in respect of, um, say, particularly in re in relation to young children, in relation to, to, to under 18s, where at the minute, as part of the organisation of an event, um, say like an outdoor an, an outdoor concert or something like that, all of the organisations um, come together to discuss it in advance. And they agree a number of, um, you know, they come, they come to an agreement um, in terms of potentially, I'm trying to come up with an example here, sorry, um, you know, an area for young families or an area where there isn't alcohol available at all, where you can't consume alcohol. Um, that's all done in agreement in advance, but then on the actual day of the event, that can be taken away and there's no recourse then um, because all they need to do is change the location the next time. Um, so. So it's just, is, that, that, it's just to it's promote greater responsibility then, really? That, that's right. It's, it's, it's to put the onus on them. It's so that if anything does go wrong, there is some sort of recourse and the police can actually place um, conditions on it. Currently, the police can only place conditions if there's undue inconvenience caused to local residents. Yeah. Okay, okay. No, I understand that. Uh, members, any further questions around that? Because we'll need to come to a decision on this uh, if we can today at some state or in our closed session. Anybody else want clarity or happy enough? 
No, okay, then we'll move on then to Clause 9. Um, members, last week we noted that the wording of the PSNI proposed amendment for Clause 9 was not suitable in legal terms. Um, we're keen to see the gap in legislation addressed. Um, we requested that the Minister make a suitable amendment to deal with this issue. So on that one, members, we're still waiting on the Minister's response on that, and we'll hopefully have that then for our first meeting back after Easter. Um, then I'm going to move on to clauses 19 and 32. Members, uh, with regard to the codes of practice, we sought a final point of clarification on this matter. And does the clause as drafted allow for the existence of a number of codes of practice written by different sectors and approved by the department? Um, Carol or Liam, I understand that you might be able to update us on this one. Yes, Chair, um, I'll take that one. Um, the the um, uh, bill as drafted does allow for uh, more than one code of practice, is, is the simple answer. Okay, thank you. Liam, I know, Kelly, this was something that you had raised in closed session last week. It was because while we have certainly a group that does provide a very good code of practice as it currently stands, um, we don't, you know, it, it, there was a, during evidence sessions, um, supermarkets, uh, potential tap rooms um, had difficulty sort of under, how would the that current code read across? So, no, if there's an opportunity to have, I think you can imagine that, um, the alcohol sales sector is a wide and varied one, um, so it means then that they can produce their own codes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, go ahead, Liam. Sorry. Oh, sorry, the, the bill is quite widely drafted and as it states at the minute, it says a, a person or group has a relevant interest if the person or group is representative of persons whose business involves the sale of intoxicating liquor under a licence, is representative of persons whose business involves the production of intoxicating liquor, uh, a representative of persons whose business involves dealing wholesale in intoxicating liquor, is engaged in research into or otherwise has an interest in the effects of the consumption of intoxicating liquor on persons or public health or on public order. So it's, it's very wide and it allows for those involved in the business to come forward with a, a code or also uh, charities, for example, or, or health organisations who are, are concerned about alcohol misuse to come forward with a code. Okay, all right, members. I'm happy enough with that response, yes? Okay. All right, then I'll move on to clauses 12 and 28 and 11 and 27, which is underage, func underage functions and private functions. Um, members are waiting for legal clarification on the supervision of children at private functions and around the time of leaving premises. Uh, again, Carol or Liam, um, we're waiting on the Minister's uh, response on that. Are, have you anything further you can add to that? Uh, no, the Chair, the, the Minister is act actively considering uh, solutions to this, but uh, I would just like to thank the Committee for highlighting these two important matters um, that uh, will, will add to the Bill uh, when we do find a, a suitable solution. Grant. Thank you, Liam. Okay, Members, we'll move on then to Clause 29. Um, uh, so last week we agreed to request that the Minister makes an amendment to extend uh, the time to time period from... Uh, I don't even know what I'm reading here. From the 1st of May to the 30th of September, and the number of nights in, in uh, then to not more than three. So what was that? Yeah, clause 29.1 and clause 29.3. Sorry, I'm not reading this right, but do members <coughs> understand what I'm saying here? Because <laughs> I don't understand at this stage. So um, yeah, on that one, that was the recommendation that that, our, that, that we had uh, looked at last week. We're still waiting on a minister's response to that also. So I don't know, Liam, anything further on that or just, as I say, just no, wait. Nothing further. Okay, that's grand. Then we'll go to clause 22. Members, last week we noted that the Minister was minded to consider the amendments to address the anomaly identified between clubs and other licensed premises regarding applications to the courts regarding alterations to premises and also <laughs> regarding the one-day membership. We requested that she makes those amendments. Again, we're waiting on a response to this and I'll ask you, Liam, again, nothing further on that? Nothing further, Chair. Grand. Okay. Um, then we'll move on to new clauses. Um, so the first one is duty to produce guidance. Members, last week we, we, we remained of the view that a clause regarding the duty to produce guidance has considerable merit and requested that the Minister makes a suitable amendment to the Bill. Again, we're waiting on the Minister's response to that. 
and then um, there was the review clause. Uh, last week, the committee remained of the view that it wishes to see a separate review clause in the bill, and we requested that the minister draft a clause which, continue, which contains a review of the implementation of provisions of the bill. We also requested that there was sub a subsequent report to the Assembly by the end of three years of the bill getting royal assent and following the first review, subsequent reviews and reports should happen within five years of the previous report. Um, so that's what members had agreed to last week. Again, we're waiting on the Minister's response to that also. Um, and then we've got uh, also additional measures, um, entertainment venues. So last week the committee discussed the potential for an amendment regarding cinemas and the Assembly Bill Office is going to bring um, a proposal to the closed session um, later on. And then also then we had the issue around minimum unit pricing members last week in closed session. The Assembly Bill Office advised the committee that the issue of minimum unit pricing is potentially within the scope of the bill. Um, the Bill Office will bring forward a proposal to us in a closed session and we'll discuss that matter uh, further. So it's just want to ask then, Liam and Carol, have you anything further you want to add at this stage on anything that has been uh, brought up there? Uh, no, Chair, I can't think of anything. Okay. Members, anything, because it, it's this stage we're going to say cheerio to Liam and Carol, unless we maybe require them at, at later on today. Members, any further questions they want to ask Liam and Carol while they're here? No. Nope, we're all right. Okay, look, thank you then, Liam and Carl, um, for being with us today. And I do know that um, if we need you later, you are available. Um, but uh, yeah. so thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you members. Okay, we're going to then. Okay, that's fine. Uh, members, we're going to then move on to agenda item nine, which is any other business. Um, so can I ask members if there are any other business they want to highlight today? Nope. Nope. Okay. Then I'm going to move to agenda item 10, which is date, time and location of our next meeting. Can I advise members our next meeting will take place on Thursday, the 15th of April, 2021 at 9.15am in room 29. Members, we're going then to go into closed session and carry on. So can I ask broadcasting to bring in um, Claire? Is Claire there, Claire McCann? Yeah. Oh, she is. She's in the room. Okay, member, I'll just remind members then um, we're going into closed session, so please stay on your star leaf. So I will uh, press the button now. We're going into closed session. Assembly, committee room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.